Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte. And this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Sunday, July 28th, 2019. This is episode 1613. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ahrefs. Whether you work for a big brand, run your own small business, or do freelance work, getting traffic to your website, always a challenge. Ahrefs is an all-in-one SEO tool set that's here to help and give you the tools you need to get your website ranked high in Google. For a seven-day trial for only $7, go to ahrefs.com to sign up. Ahrefs. And by LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Just remember your master password and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got your smartphones. We've got your smart watches. we got all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. If it's got a chip in it, I mean, we can talk about it. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still reach us if you're uh, from New Zealand or China or wherever you are in the world. Just use Skype out and call that number. It's a toll-free number, so it should be free. 8888-ASK-LEO. So um, big, I think the big story of the week was the T-Mobile Sprint merger is mostly okay. I don't say fully uh, full speed ahead. It's not a go yet. But the FCC uh, said, OK, the Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Justice said, OK, now uh, all that remains is some couple of dozen states attorneys general who have been suing to prevent the merger saying, oh, man, we need four cell phone companies. I, you know, I kind of like what the DOJ did. I feel like, and I would bet that the attorneys general will drop their suits. If not, this is going to really drag out because uh, the trial's not till September. It could even be December because of this new information. They might get a delay, and this could go on and on and on. What we have is one phone company, Sprint, that's just dying, just really s struggling. Another company, T-Mobile, that has, through better marketing, I think, and, and just clever strategy, thanks to their CEO, John Ledger, and, and others, I guess, uh, put together a, a darn fine cell phone company. And I'm a customer. Of course, I'm a customer of all of them. But I like T-Mobile. I think they've done a good job. Sprint recently got backing from Japan's SoftBank. That means they at least have some money. T-Mobile's backed by Deutsche Telekom, the big German telecommunications company but with the merger they will become uh pretty much the same size as verizon at&t you know within a hair's breadth of each other we'll have three very big companies and of course the problem is when you're small you know when you have 10 million customers you're just doing everything you can to get 11 million customers when you have 100 million customers you're just trying to hold on <laughs> let's just keep those customers and i'm quoting here a guy named charlie ergen I have a lot of respect for Charlie Ergen, an interesting fellow who is a big part of this deal. He doesn't work at T-Mobile. He doesn't work at Sprint. He was, for a long time, a professional poker player who uh, was an analyst and uh, for Frito-Lay, counting potato chips. In 1980... <laughs> he actually was a, such a good poker player, he was and, and Blackjack was he was banned. By some Las Vegas casinos, he said, "You can't, you can't come here. Count our cards. How dare you, Charlie?" In other words, a smart guy, and also a go-getter, right? You know, you got to have some uh, ambition to do that. In 1980, he uh, he left his job at Frito Lay, the potato chip manufacturer, got together with his buddy, pulled together about sixty thousand dollars, and uh, his buddy, his buddy who I've also met, by the way, I've met, I've met both of them. Uh, Jim DeFranco, another poker player, by the way. They uh, pooled their money, $60,000, and uh, and started a, a business selling the 
the 10 foot satellite, you know, the big satellite dishes in Denver. This is 1980. Eventually, he built a company that sold the littler dishes, the, you know, the hubcap sized dishes, and took on cable TV, created a little company you might know as Dish, the Dish Network. 12 million customers. He is now worth his $60,000 investment in 1980, now worth $9 billion. $9 billion. So he's done all right. He also owns Echostar, a satellite company. And uh, he has been, over the last decade, collecting something that's very valuable, almost as good as poker chips or gold. He's been collecting wireless spectrum frequencies, sometimes to the <laughs> dismay of the Federal Communications Commission and the other carriers, because he's not using them. He's sitting on them. He's been a smart like a fox collecting these frequencies. When T-Mobile was told by the Department of Justice, look, this merger is not going to happen unless you somehow do something to create a fourth carrier. You divest yourself of Boost Mobile, your other, your other uh, little mobile companies, and, and do something to make a big carrier, Metro PCS. So when that happened... John Ledger, the CEO of T-Mobile, placed a call to Charlie Ergen, the CEO, CEO of DISH, and said, we should talk. And that's how DISH became a big player in all of this. In fact, the FCC is demanding that they start a fourth cellular company in the United States, and they get it up and running fast. But here's where Charlie was smart. He got all those frequencies, some really juicy ones, didn't do anything, still hasn't done anything with them. He was waiting. He said, why build a, an LTE network or a 4G network when you're just going to have to scrap everything and build a 5G network a few years later? He was waiting for 5G, the next generation of cell phone communications. And, you know, sometimes it's better not to have existing infrastructure to start from scratch. Sometimes you get an advantage doing that. So it's going to be interesting. He will be Dish, the new Dish. And I don't know if they'll call it Dish, but the, I hope they don't because that's a terrible name. It's fine if you have a satellite dish, but it doesn't make any sense for a cell phone carrier. Will be 100% uh, 5G. They're not going to do LTE or 3G or even old style phone service or text. It'll be a self service company in that sense, you know, that you can use your cell phone with it, but it'll all be on the 5G network. He's, this is, he's all in in poker terms. He's pushed his chips to the center of the table and said, because it's going to cost him big, $10 billion at least, to roll out this network. At least. And you know how that is when they say numbers like that. You know, it goes up. Dish will initially use T-Mobile's towers and so forth. That was part of the deal, too. They will um, they'll kind of start off that way. Charlie says Dish can offer on-demand pricing something the cell carriers don't do, charging less in the middle of the night. He's going to target businesses like automakers who are putting cell connections in their cars, right? All the new cars, they have cell connections. They'll have 5G connections. Charlie says, we're going to get someplace in three years that took the other guys 10. I think this is exciting and interesting. And it, it could, <laughs> Charlie's known, man, this guy's a character. I was, uh, years ago, I did... Uh, he, he has a show on a dish called Charlie Chat. Met the guy, went out to his studio in Denver and did Charlie Chat and was, was impressed by... He's, a, he's what you call a maverick. He's one of those guys... And we are, in a way, blessed. I think we're surrounded by interesting, creative business types. Maybe in the, you know, the robber barons of the turn of the last century, the, the John D. Rockefellers, the Andrew Carnegies are kind of like that. I'm thinking Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and now Charlie Ergen. These guys who are willing to risk it all on a crazy idea to do something amazing. You know, Elon's plan, besides, you know, he did Tesla, but he also has SpaceX. He wants to go to Mars, but the thing I think he's doing that's the most interesting is his thing Starlink. 
they're going to launch more than 10, I think 12,000 satellites, low Earth orbit satellites, to provide high speed gigabit internet access to every square inch of the planet in five years. Wow. <laughs> That's the kind of that's the kind of big thinking I think that could change the world. I think Charlie has something like that in mind too. Fascinating to watch. You know, and it's his chips. He's risking, not ours. Uh, he's uh, he's in a battle with the FCC because um, he bought some FCC uh, licenses in 2015, a big chunk of wireless license. FCC said, we're going to give a big discount to small guys. We want to bring small players into the wireless uh, industry. So he got a $3.3 .3 billion discount. And then they said, hey, wait a minute. Dish isn't a small guy. They later rejected the discount. Now they're in court. Last year, the FCC wrote a letter, according to the Wall Street Journal, that threatened to take back some of Dish's licenses if they don't launch the cellular service by this March. Well, I think maybe they maybe they will have us. They're going to have something by March, if all goes well. So, watch with interest. Charlie's going to pay a one point four billion dollars for Sprint's customers, the the Boost Mobile stuff, or I guess that's the Metro PCS, right? Three point six billion dollars for the in three years for the extra airwaves, and uh, and he's got to start a competitor. Last sentence of the Wall Street Journal article, he says, I think three years from now, this transaction will look better than it does right now. Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, they're going to have real competition. That's how you got to This is the Wild West. This guy, I love it. Kind of rooting for Charlie Ergen and Dish. And you know, it would be good for us if there is a fourth carrier that, like T-Mobile used to be, is kind of aggressive and decides to turn the industry on its ear. All right, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. I'd love to hear from you if you want to talk high tech. we we'll talk about that or anything else on your mind. 888-827-5536. Everything we talk about, we put up on the website, so you don't have to write anything down. Uh, techguylabs.com. Thank you, James DeRuvo, for writing everything I say down. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Website, techguylabs.com. That's free. There's no sign-up. You'll get your calls going right after this. Ladies and gentlemen... Kimmy, don't take no Schmidt. It is our very own Kim Schaffer on the horn. Hello, Kimmy. Good morning. How are you today? Great. I heard a tech story on the way here. Yes. And I don't know if you've heard it, but it made me chuckle. Yes. Pampers is coming out with a new smart diaper. Oh, it's no. It's going to text you when your child needs Poops. to be changed. That's. <laughs> I think you don't really need that. I think that we've gone millions of years without needing As that. As <laughs> someone who has changed thousands of diapers in my lifetime, I believe that... And, th and then here's the other problem. That means there's a chip in it and a battery. And then yeah. you're going to throw that out? Yeah, yeah. There's some kind of sensor. I assume, oh, maybe, you, know I, what, maybe I assume you, you just, probably put the sensor there's a pocket. in it. Yeah, maybe pocket. there's a pocket in the diaper. I, I don't think it. that... Because the, that would be yeah. wasteful. Not that... Companies that make paper <laughs> diapers aren't wasteful or anything. Wow, Pampers with a chip uh, in them. It just it, it made me smart laugh. diapers. Yep. Yeah, that kind of says it all <laughs> right there. There's a chip in everything, and we'll talk there about is. it, right? Yes. Kim is, uh, has been in here since the wee hours of the morning. Um, yeah. Polishing up the phones, <laughs> getting them ready for your use, and she has delivered. I see. Some fine callers for our program today. Who should I start with? How about CJ in Murrieta, California? CJ in Murrieta, California. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Hello, Hello. CJ. Leo here. How are Hi. you? Hi, Leo. Good, thank you. Um, I purchased a 2014 Lincoln MKZ, and it had Sync, which is like their communication. Yeah, that's or... Ford's, Ford's uh, Ford, which makes Lincoln their, um, their platform for voice communications. Exactly. Well, they no longer support it. Oh, man. Why <laughs> you? Why I order? They, their new cars or their new Lincoln MKZs now have the Apple Play. Yeah. The car companies yeah. were smart because they realized that they're, you know, the, the, the life development cycle for a car is five, six years. In five years, everything changes. Your cell phone updates every year, right? So why not just put the cell phone in the car? And that's what Android Auto and CarPlay do. <laughs> 
And then exactly. then we don't have to worry about all that stuff. So that was a smart move, but it kind of leaves you out in the in the dust. Yeah. So I was wanting to see if I can download Apple Play. No. And get rid of my sync. No, it's a hardware solution, unfortunately. So, oh. um, yeah. So the car companies that provide CarPlay or Android Auto, and usually you get both. Although I noticed the new BMWs only have and uh, CarPlay. They don't have Android Auto because I guess if you have a Beamer, why would you ever want anything besides an iPhone? And oh, by the <laughs> way, we're going to charge you eighty dollars a year for the price for the privilege of using it. So um, be glad you don't have a Beamer, I guess, would be the answer on that. I actually like those Lincoln MKZs. They're quite nice. Yeah, you're kind of just stuck. You're stuck. This was the problem, right? You're stuck now. So the cars yeah. take five years to develop and then 10 years. You drive them for 10 years. And to 15 years in, in technology is an infinite lifetime. So True. your next car and my next car, too, will have CarPlay and Android Auto. I, I, I just won't buy a car that doesn't have that because that way, every time I get a new phone, I get new features. The Apple and, and, and Google are always updating the capabilities of CarPlay. Now, you could put a new head end in. This would be the only way you could do this. You, you, you probably remember in the old days, you go to the car stereo store, mm -hmm. right? And they put in yeah. a stereo and a little and a subwoofer in the back seat and all that stuff. It, <laughs> yeah. I, they're gone. I can't. All of our car stereo stores went away in Petaluma. But I suppose somewhere you could get this. There are companies like Alpine and others that will make a replacement head end. Actually, you know who's on the line with me? He was probably an expert in all this. We're going to talk to him in the next break. Sam Abul Samit. He's our car guy. Hi, Sam. Hey, Leo. How are you? Today? I don't mean to jump you on this one, but you're probably listening. No, I've been listening in. What do you um, think? And yeah, um, unfortunately, um, one of the problems with newer cars is that the way they've integrated the infotainment systems in there, it, you really can't, you can't take rip it out, it out. And replace it with an aftermarket system. If you have an older car, like something you know ten years old or more, you can easily take out. The, so my Datsun, the factory unit. I could take my Datsun and put in an Alpine, and I'd have CarPlay. Absolutely, but her fancy yeah. new Lincoln MKZ. You can't, nope. you can't Unfortunately, take it out. she's probably out of luck. You could duct tape uh, it to the dashboard. <laughs> you could just do that. Um, or, you know, if, if you were an Android user, um, Android Auto actually has a phone interface. So right. if you are if you have a car stereo that doesn't support Android Auto, you can launch the Android Auto app on the phone. You probably, and if you have your, Lincoln, in a, in a, your Lincoln yeah. uh, CJ probably has a, an auxiliary uh, jack, you know, for the audio. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe even you could do it via USB. So, what you are you Apple or or an Android? Apple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what what you can do um, with that? What what year? What model year was that at Lincoln? Twenty fourteen. So that has support for uh, Sync App Link. So what you can do is there are a bunch of apps that will work with that. So if you have your phone paired to uh, paired to the car over Bluetooth, um, you can use the the App Link system to control certain apps um, through the interface that's, on, that's in the car. I just, you know what and I do? They, yeah. that it, they no longer support it. Oh, so great. You know what I do? It's kind of like dead. I, before I got drive anywhere, because you can't touch your cell phone while you're driving, I set up the map, I put it in the cup holder, I turn it up way loud, and that's how I drive. Unfortunately, <laughs> you just okay. missed the cutoff, CJ. I'm sorry. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's pretty funny. Somebody's uh, saying in the uh, chat room, Sam, they were watching um, Scotty Kilmer's YouTube video, and they had a Chevy SSR. They changed the radio, and the car wouldn't start anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsies. Yeah, cl clearly miswired something there. Whoopsies. Yeah, I mean, the HVAC goes through it. Everything, if you look at your con center console now, it all goes through that. Yeah, that's 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 a real problem. So if you know, and if you if you hit, kind of hit that cutoff point where the car has support for Android Auto or CarPlay, you're you're golden. But if you have something that was in that few few year period there when they started to really integrate this stuff, and then but before they the had bad, Android Auto the bad CarPlay, time. yeah, yeah, I feel bad they discontinued Sync because I liked Ford Sync and well, my Mustang. well, they they actually they haven't discontinued it. They, they've just gone to a new version of. It. They're on Sync version three now. Oh. So what? Uh, have what they, have they killed the my Sync Ford two? They killed my Ford Touch. I hope. Yeah, my Ford Touch that was, was Sync version two. Okay, yeah. so they've gone to something. Is it better the new one? 
Oh, it's much, much better. Yeah. yeah. The the problem with, with version two with my Ford Touch and my Lincoln Touch was it was underpowered. It had yeah. it didn't have enough compute to to handle what they were trying to do on there and so it often crashed and uh, it was slow and laggy and the interface frankly was not oh, really well awful. designed for use. It's it, like somebody many, had never this, used a computer before or something. It was crazy. Yeah, it 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 was so, it was pretty bad. Good. So I'm glad Sync Three is better. Because I was a big oh, sync, yeah. sync advocate, I really liked Sync. Um, are they? They're not using Microsoft Auto anymore. No, it's it's actually it, running on QNX it's now. QNX, like they completely like, rebuilt it from the ground up. Everybody else, they went to QNX, which yeah, is funny. Mo that's most, keep, but not everybody. There's Black a lot of Barry people actually alive. using Android. Yeah, really. That's all right. Yeah, I don't and, mind that. Yeah. And there's also automotive grade Linux, uh, which is what Toyota's using now. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know my Tesla had Linux. It was Linux based my my old tesla oh i miss it but i like the uh, i like the bolt a whole lot i feel like for that price difference it's a really it's a yeah, better it's, choice it's it's an it's an excellent car it's a great car and you know while it's new we don't know yet how its reliability will be i bet the reliability will be, will be superb yeah, I mean, like like any other EV, it should it should do fine. There there yeah. were a few early customers that had uh, there were some battery issues with some oh, of the early ones. Interesting. Um, and I mean, those were replaced under warranty, so sure. it wasn't wasn't a big deal. Uh, but as far as I know, right now they're they're doing fine. Good. It's time for Sam Abul Samad. He's principal researcher at Navigant Research, host of the Wheel Bearings podcast at Wheel Bearings Media, and talks about cars. And he made a cameo a little earlier on we were talking a little bit about uh carplay and so forth the, i like carplay uh android auto both of those and i think that that's a really good solution for auto manufacturers that aren't going to really um keep their software up to date but you said not everybody uses it there's other choices out there yeah um i mean there there's a there are other solutions out there most manufacturers are now including uh, both Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Uh, a few are doing CarPlay only, uh, like you mentioned BMW. And for why is that reason, annoying they, that they're charging eighty bucks for that? Since we all know yeah, it costs I've, nothing. I've, 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 well, actually, I've been told by somebody at BMW that Apple actually does charge a licensing fee oh. uh, for that, which is why – so they're basically passing along that license fee. Oh. I don't think it's quite $80 a year. I would be surprised if it's that much. Uh, but I've, that's actually something I'm looking into right now to uh, try to understand how much Apple's actually charging companies. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Google does not charge for Android Auto, but I'm looking into that as well. So – uh, you know, it's right now for you know everybody that offers it except BMW. You know, it's just included in there. You don't, you're not paying any anything extra for it, or at least they're not they're not adding it uh, explicitly, adding it to the price. You know, they're bundling it into their the bill of materials of the car. Yeah. So what do you want to talk about today besides that? <laughs> so um, as as you know, we're still in the in the the middle of summer here, and yeah. it's quite hot. You know, it's been in the the upper 80s and 90s here in Michigan, uh, and I think it's probably been similar around uh, around Petaluma recently. Uh, and some, certainly, there's parts of the countries where it's much hotter than that. And uh, you know, so just a, you know, as a little reminder um, to you know, to be careful, you know, if you leave somebody in the car or, you know, leave an animal in the car. You know what I'm loving uh, these know, days got, in mar modern cars? Our Bolt does this. They warn you if there's a, somebody in the back seat as you're getting out of the car. I think yeah, that's such a great absolutely. idea. It could be a dog, could be a child, could be a yep. gross, could be a bag of groceries. But it's nice to have that warning. I like that. Yeah, several uh, several manufacturers, uh, GM, uh, Nissan, uh, and there's a couple of others I think that are now um, uh, they've they've built in some logic in there that tracks when you open the doors and, and close the doors, and you know when uh, the sequence, you know when the ignition starts and you put it in gear, so that if it detects that you have opened the door, opened the back door, and then closed the door, and then gotten into the front seat, started the car, driven, and then you get out. Uh, when you open the front door again, it will you know give you an alert. Say, hey, check the back seat for for anything that you might have left behind or anyone that you might have left behind, you know, or your dog, um, you know. So because it you know your car when it's sitting out in the sun, it's like a greenhouse, and it can easily get you know even if the temperature is below 100 degrees ambient, it can easily get to 130, 140 or more in the car in a fairly short period of time, 
and that can cause you know heat stroke uh, and and death you know and a lot of yeah. uh, you know uh, you, we, every year we hear about kids that got left in the car uh, even for short periods of time somebody dashed into the store uh, to grab something and you know they come back and you know the, the child has suffered from heat stroke uh, Tesla actually does uh, something really cool uh, because it's electric you know they have the opportunity uh, what they do is they have what they call their dog mode but it, you know uh, they you know they're they're Theoretically, you know, it could apply to children as well. You shouldn't be leaving the kids in the car unattended anyway. But, you know, they call it their dog mode, which um, keeps uh, – you can leave the air conditioning on in the car to keep the temperature reasonable at a reasonable level, uh, you know, so that your dog, you know, sitting in the car doesn't uh, – you know, isn't going to get overheated. And it, what it also does is on that big giant screen in the middle of the car, it, it says, you know, gives an alert. So if somebody come, walks up to the car and sees the dogs in there and it's hot out, you know, they can look at the screen and, you know, it'll say, hey, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about the dog. Dog mode is engaged. The I air think conditioning's they, on. I think they had to do that because initially people's windows were getting broken. Because they yes. leave, <laughs> leave their dog in their Tesla <laughs> and reasonably, you know, humanitarians were concerned and broke the window to free the dog. No, he's fine. He's actually cooler than you are. He's getting air conditioned yeah. right now. I but, think that's a nice uh, yeah, feature. But, uh, I never used it because I always was nervous somebody would break my window. So <laughs> right, but at the very least, you know, just um, you know, having that alert there just to give you a quick reminder, you know, whether whether you've got a, a child in the car yeah, or that. even you know if you've got some groceries in the car. I know there, are, you know, there have been times when I have inadvertently uh, left you know a doggy bag from from a restaurant or left some groceries in the car and come in the house, um, you know, and several hours later, it's like oh. Damn, I forgot it. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. and then, then you got to throw it away. Um, so, you know, I, I never left my kids in the car, you know, and so, but yeah, definitely, you know, don't leave your kids in the car. But, uh, you know, this this is a helpful, helpful little piece of technology. It doesn't, you know, doesn't really add any cost. You know, they're just adding a little bit of software to, you know, keep track of when things are opening and closing and, and just give you a reminder. Nice. Very nice. Well, I uh, I did turn in my Tesla. I'm sad to say it's uh, it's history. I'm no longer. I really was a that was a kind of a that was kind of def a, a defining automobile. You know, sometimes you have a yeah, car. Absolutely. You know, I'm a Mustang driver, or in your case, <laughs> I'm a Miata <laughs> driver, and it's it defines your personality. I think for Tesla's uh, owners, particularly, I'm a Tesla owner. It says something about you. Maybe not something complimentary. Well, that, that's that's actually you know cars in general you know have for a long time been something that you know is an outward expression of who you are you yeah. know which is why we have yeah. so many different kinds of cars yeah uh, you know it's kind of it's, silly it's just a cars, thing or SUVs. it doesn't yeah. it doesn't really determine who you are but still yeah yeah it, it, you know, but you know, especially you know, for environmentally friendly cars like EVs and hybrids, uh, that's you know, you know that that's one of the reasons why you know Toyota kept the Prius looking the way they did for so long, you know, because it, people saw Prius and they knew that okay, that's somebody. Well, they, they would think a variety of different things, but one of the things they would think about the person driving that car is that's somebody who cares about the environment, and the same thing now yeah. applies to Teslas. Yeah, uh, Teslas you know, so, is somebody who cares about the environment and it has more money than sense. Well, there's so it says two too. things about you. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. You know, I didn't want to go down that path. <laughs> it is, isn't it the case though? When you get to now here in California, and I don't know if you have this in Detroit, but in California we have something called a four-way stop, and it requires a certain amount of civility because the rule is when you get to this four-way stop, there's you know it's across uh, roads that the first person goes, and then the next person, and the next person. But whenever, at least for me, and I apologize for this, I know it's a bias, it's a, I'm, I'm prejudiced, but when I pull up to a four-way stop and I see somebody in a Mercedes or a BMW, I know they're going to go before it's their turn. I just know it. <laughs> Am I wrong? Um, you're not entirely wrong. <laughs> it's a, it's a terrible entirely... prejudice on my part. Now, I, I don't know. Sure. What I'm do people sure tell me now? Because you could tell me, what do people think when they pull get to a four-way stop and there's a, a Tesla driver there? They're, they probably think the same thing, don't they? Jerk. Um, I, jerk. I think in California, they, they, in many cases, they probably do. But I don't think it's necessarily based on specifically on the brand of car they drive. But the fact that 
um, in some cases, because these are more expensive cars. I go uh, first. These are more affluent customers. I'm better than and you. They, they have a certain I, sense of entitlement. I go first. That's just yeah. that's the rule. I read it in the book. I go first. That's right. Well, now that I drive a lowly Chevy Bolt, I, I, I always let everybody else go first. I love my Chevy Bolt, by the way. Fortunately, here we're, we're increasingly putting in uh, roundabouts uh, in place of a lot yeah, of four-way stuff. Boy, you know what? Uh, next time, let's talk about roundabouts. I think this is brilliant. I love yeah, this. I love them. They're starting to put yeah. them in in Petaluma, too, instead of four-way stops. But people don't know how to drive in a roundabout. I know. That, that has been a problem here. People still... We've had him for 10 years. We're still learning how to use <laughs> Hey, thank you, Sam, for indulging my biases. Sam Abul Samid, wheelbearings.media for his great podcast. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right. <laughs> I should never have aired my biases. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to go there. You know, I'm trying to be civil. Well, how do people see Tesla drivers, honestly? They, they think they're kind of dopey they, right yeah i mean well you know t tesla drivers are the new bmw drivers yeah they are you know? we yeah, used people, to when i first, so i got mine three years ago and there was few enough teslas on the road that you would wave every time you saw another tesla guy mm -hmm. right you go hey yeah yeah we, we got the teslas now they're everywhere. I our parking lot has three Teslas in it. it it's no longer it's it's no longer a badge of uh, status. The, te Tesla, Tesla is the new uh, Silicon Valley Camry. It is. Every California yeah. is loaded, and of course it's because our climate is perfect for Teslas. When we were in L.A., I saw nothing yeah, but for Teslas. EVs in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think this Bolt for for one quarter the cost of the Tesla is uh, is just as good, if not better. I'm very happy with it. And I like a smaller vehicle. It's easier to park, easier to drive. Oh, especially when you go into San Francisco. Oh, God. I, the, you know, I was always terrified going into San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't know. Have you noticed there's a lot of ACDC now in movies? And it's like they're back. Maybe they, I told my wife that. She said, they never, honey, they never left. Yeah. We're on a highway to H-E double hockey sticks. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Richie on the line from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hello, Richie. Hello, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? First off, uh, you need to do a control-alt-delete on whatever it is behind, right behind you. That's has my, has my computer crashed? Oh, it has. Thank you for telling mm -hmm. me. So Richie's watching. We do a video stream. I know people on the radio, people listen to the radio. Go, what is he talking about? We do a video stream because I remember I saw Dynamis do it and uh, Howard Stern does it. So we thought, oh, we should do a video stream because what's more fascinating than watching a guy on the radio? And then when we realized how boring that was, I started to put junk behind me. Kind of looks like a Cracker Barrel now, right? I mean, there's all this stuff behind me. One of those things though is a is a kind of cool device. It's a PDP. Are you old enough to remember the PDP series computers? Yes, I am. It was a PDP eleven. This Correct. was this was the pre pre. These are microcomputers before there were mini computer or um, the mini computers before there were microcomputers like the IBM. I go, PC. All, I go all the way back to the MITS computer. Oh man, that was the first kit computer. That was what started it all. The MITS Altair. Wow. Did you build one? No. <laughs> Right not. Yeah. That's the one that uh, that uh, Steve Ballmer saw on the cover of Popular Mechanics magazine comes running into the into into his Harvard dorm room where Bill Gates is sleeping and slaps him with it. <laughs> Says, "Bill, wake up. Wake up. Look at this. There's a business here. We got to we got to start making software for these guys." And that's of course how Microsoft started. They dropped out of school, went to Albuquerque and created Microsoft. So this thing, yeah, you're right, I have to reboot it. It's actually a Raspberry Pi with a PDP, a beautiful PDP-11 front face that uh, a guy named Oscar Vermeulen sells these. And he, he did a perfect job of reproducing the PDP-11. Down to the switch is actually working. So it's uh, he calls it the PIDP-11. You can actually, uh, if you search for PIDP-11, you can find his website which is called Obsolescence Guaranteed. 
<laughs> and, you, and you can buy one for a surprisingly good price. But yes, mine seems to have crashed. So thank you for letting me know. I have to uh, have to reboot it. I, it means I have to flip the switches for the bootloader program, though. You know, I got to find my tape, my paper tape. What can I do for you, Richie? Okay, uh, I got an old Toshiba laptop. Uh, hard disk died a few years back. I replaced yeah. it with yeah. a terabyte drive and not thinking I never repartitioned it uh, just one terabyte and now I've got to the point where my goal is I would like to repartition it down to 200 250 gigabyte sectors drives so I can do a image backup to an SSD and then replace the hard drive with the SSD well, here's the good news. You don't need to because the image backup, in, in almost every case with a good image backup program, will not be bigger than the actual data on there. They'll squeeze it down. They'll say, and the rest is empty. <laughs> so you don't need it. I understand you want to make an image backup that's smaller than a terabyte. Yes. And you sh it should be 256 gigs or whatever you've used roughly in size, maybe slightly larger on on which which uh, which image program are you using? I haven't chosen one yet. Yeah, so there's a lot of good ones. There's good free ones that are. What you pay for when you buy one is you pay for ease of use. Um, I use one called from a. Uh, I think it's terabyte. It's called Drive Image, which is the worst name ever. Because but it's very generic, but I, I like it a lot. It's from terabyteunlimited.com. And it's smart enough that it will say, it's called uh, Image for Windows. That's the name of it. You're running Windows 10? Yes. Yeah. You can add, Windows 10 actually comes with an image, sort of an image backup, but I like to use a third party one. This isn't expensive. I think it's 40 or 50 bucks. You can do a 30 day free trial, see if you like it. Uh, okay. and, and it will automatically size it down to no more than it needs to record the data. Okay, when I do want to do a defrag on my drive, it you shows the graphic representation of the hard disk. Yeah, you don't need to do that and anymore. I've, you don't need to do that I've, anymore. I've got files at the beginning, at the end, and in the middle. And the ones in the middle and the end are marked as unmovable. Yeah, I yeah. They're a system file. That's right. So, so what happens if I try to partition it down that down? They'll move them. <laughs> Don't, uh, if you want to repartition, you can. If you right click in Windows uh, on the Start menu or you hit Start X, you will get a, um, a special, you know, that special menu, and one of the items in there will be d the uh, Storage Manager or Disk Management, I guess they call it. And in there is that's actually a partitioner. You can resize most drives that way. And stuff that's immovable will just has to be at the end of the drive. That's all. It doesn't have to be at that particular sector, so they can move that out of the way. So before you start partitioning, <laughs> make that image. So that's an important in order. You want to do it the other way around, which is partition first, then make the image. Okay, you can, but if anything goes wrong, you'll wish you'd done it the other way around. So, so go get to. There's many other companies that make great imagers. Uh, people like EaseUS. That one's free. Um, a Cronus True Image is kind of the king of the hill. That's usually pricey, although it comes apparently with some Western Digital Drive. So depending on what drive you're getting, you you might actually have a free copy of that. But I like Terabyte Software's uh, Image for Windows. Um, they keep it up to date. It works with Windows 10. One of the reasons I like it is you don't have to exit Windows to use it. Make that image first. Make that image first. You'll see it's small. The size is not going to be the full terabyte. It'll be small, as small as it needs to be to store the data. They even have a compression switch. It'll compress it even more because a lot of that data is highly compressible. And it will restore to whatever size partition you decide, including a smaller or larger partition. It has all those features built into it. Then, if you want to still want to resize your partition, do it. But don't do it first. Back it up first. <laughs> Always back it up before you start. Partitioning is fraught with peril. 8888, ask Leo if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. You want to talk high tech, you got a partitioner you like. A lot of people in the chat room have favorites you know what let's uh james let's write down all the different ones people are mentioning because there's a lot of different partition programs i used uh for a long time a german one uh called um oh i can't remember now 
It was very good. But 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 Steve Gibson, my hard drive guru, says drive image. So that's the one I use from Terabyte. Gabriel, Brooklyn. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Gabriel. Hello. Hello. Yes, hi. Um, so I had a an issue with a certain computer, well, electronic company. Um, and I had ordered a uh, WordPerfect Corral Office, X, uh, X9, I believe, was the edition, uh, online. And basically, I had trouble downloading it. Uh, so I went online and tried to get on their chat service or whatever, and I spoke to somebody, and immediately they wanted me to let them get onto my computer. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself... Don't. <laughs> Don't. I know. <laughs> no, well, I never did. And I was like, I was wondering why that was the first thing they wanted me well, to do. Well, where did you get the number for Corel? Did you get it from Corel's website, or did you Google support? No, no, no. I was on with Best Buy. Well, Best Buy, okay. And if you're sure it's Best Buy... You know, that way they don't have to ask you a lot of questions. A lot of times you get a user on in your tech support and you say things like, well, how much hard drive space do you have? And they say, I'm pretty sure it's a, a four gigabyte machine. And you know that's not the answer. So they just say, let me add it. Let me get in there. If you know and trust the person, okay. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, Best Buy, you know, it's the Geek Squad. They're just trying to short, short circuit it because they don't want to have to ask you a lot of tech questions well the funny thing was they they kept they kept insisting that i had to go well you don't have to onto my computer yeah you don't have to they were insisting they didn't want to do it any other way other than yeah coming back yeah because they don't because honestly you know. it's a late it's it's a geek shortcut it's the same reason if you had the if you had the it guy come to your house he would elbow you out of the way and, oh, say, no, I know. and say, get out of here, let me sit down. And then he'd type really, really fast. Right. He'd say, it's all done, and leave, and your computer would be unusable. It's the same oh, no, exact I, I mindset. I the remote, you yeah. know. I mean, I've done it for my mother. I, I use the remote right. PT, actually, right. to help her. But you're right but to I be nervous, like Gabriel. You're right. The first thing they did. Yeah, it's basically... And then the other thing was they wanted me to buy... A start, they wanted to know if I bought the service protection. Oh, jeez, Louise. Like, <laughs> did, you, did you buy the Corel from them? Did you buy WordPerfect from them? Yeah, that's the thing. I uh, bought it from them. Yeah, and so Corel probably says, oh, no, you got to get your support from the guy who sold it to you. Oh, no, well, that was the thing. I did email Corel. Good. And they kept saying you have to go back to Best Buy. Oh. And eventually, I just went to Best Buy, and I said, listen, I want the hard the hard copy. Forget the, uh, the online Yeah, yeah, copy. give me the discs, yeah. And they wanted to, they wanted me to pay a, a dollar something. <laughs> I was like, I'm I'm getting the same thing. It's the same price. Please, please, I just want it on a disc. Please. The woman insisted. She was like, it's it, it it's just you know that it must be the tax or something like that. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Finally, they got the guy and he just uh, canceled it out. Good. Or he said, here, take it. Did it work once you got the discs? Oh yeah, no, it worked fine oh, when I got the disc, oh, but good. it was just crazy that I didn't. I, I had to go into the store just to get the the, the, the discs. What a world! That they're, uh, what a world! I know, and that was crazy. And I'm like, I'm glad I know a, a little bit about remote things because I wouldn't let anybody on. No, <laughs> I mean, I think Best Buy you could trust them and all that stuff, but you don't know. Maybe right. that maybe the guy this weekend. Somebody offered him a thousand dollars and said, "Just get me a computer." Actually, one of the things right. Best Buy we know does they 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 act as spies for federal law enforcement. They actually there was quite a bit mm. of a fuss over this uh, because they were turning people in. So uh, yeah, you know what? I now that you mention it, don't let them on your computer. <laughs> You're absolutely no, right. Why would I want You're it? absolutely right. I was like. I'll, for that, I'll come in and, and, and throw the computer at you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ask you to do yeah, it. yeah. But, but it's the same. You understand the impulse. It's like I don't. I don't want to ask you a bunch of questions. I don't have that luxury on this show, right? I can't say, "Oh, get out of the way. Let me just fix your computer." I have to walk oh, no. through it. And sometimes I have to admit, I hear that people are not the best witnesses for their own uh, defense. If you know what I mean. No, I hear that. I used to have a friend. He was the one that t taught me years, years, years back. When I first started computing, and that's what he would do. He would just push me aside, yeah. 
get in there. And, yeah, let me in here. But then I would watch him, you know. And, right. And see now what you was learn. Going on. And I also were watching you and, on on uh, the screensavers and. Oh, oh nice. Wow. We go way back then, you and me. That's awesome. Oh yeah. Well, I I remember. I was thinking just recently about the first episode you did, right after nine eleven. You oh, did. The remember the candles. The big, well, the candles, and then you did the the episode about the building, the way it was created, yeah. to collapse the way it yeah. did, and stuff like that. Oh man, I remember those days. That was very tough. We 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 went oh, off the yeah. air for a while, but we eventually we had to come back. And no, no, I know, right? It well, was I very think hard. Look back, and you were, you were back on. I think by the fourteenth of that month. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Yeah, they well, they, yeah. you know, they, there's pressure to get back on the air. Um, and we really thought along uh, about how how we wanted to do it, and uh, I thought we did it in a in a in a nice way. Uh, you know what? No, what, it was very. One was of the really reasons nice. we did it is we realized that our audience was a community, and our community mm -hmm. was hurting too, right? Uh, people like you living in New York, but also just all over the world. And we felt like you know we don't want to abandon our community, so we need to do something with our community to talk about it. And that's what we ended sure, up doing. Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I thought that was no, quite, that was quite great. sensible. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Gabriel, Definitely. for listening all those years. You're welcome. I thank you. I appreciate it. And you know what? Somebody in the chat room said, Leo, would you let anybody you get online on your computer? Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. not. So you're right, Gabriel. You're absolutely right. No, right. Yeah. yeah. Have yeah, a great... Thank you very much. Have a great one. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, augmented reality, anything with a chip in it. Now I have to add Pampers diapers because they have smart diapers. Anything with a chip in it, 8888-ASK-LEO. Although I don't do diaper support, I have to draw the line somewhere. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. You can also... Um, if you want to visit our website, because everything we talk about ends up there, thanks to James. He's writing it all down. TechGuyLabs.com. That's free. Answers, links, even audio and video after the fact uh, on the website. TechGuyLabs.com. And we'll put a link there to that PiDP11 that Oscar Vermeulen uh, does. I've, I've rebooted mine. It's a Raspberry Pi running PDP emulation software. PDP was uh, an early mini computer from the Digital Equipment Corporation. In fact, really a very important uh, computer used in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, but like computers in that era, it wasn't really interactive. It was really designed to be used with a terminal. In order to get it running, it has switches, flip little flip switches on the front. Uh, you had to load uh, the operating system manually. And the trick was you flip these switches in, in a particular order to actually put a program in memory, a small program called the bootloader. It was just a little thing so that it, was, it gave it enough smarts to then load the paper tape, which would then load the full operating system. So in these days, in the old days, PDP-11 operators, PDP-8 operators would have memorized this sequence of switches. I think it was several hundred to to switch in the bootloader program so they could get the thing up and running. Which is why, when it stops blinking, you go, oh, man. <laughs> Bad timing. 8888 to ask Leo the phone number. There, That's a bit of history going way, way back. Let's go to line four. Lori on the line from West L.A. Hello, Lori. Hey, how's it going? It's great. How are you? Uh, pretty good generally, but uh -oh. I have been waiting all weekend to talk to you because oh, I'm no. going nuts over my daughter's laptop. Uh-oh. Well, I'm glad you got in. What's going on? Okay. Uh, understand I'm the techie in the family and my kids are in the twenty in their 20s, so it's, it's a strange house. <laughs> I here. love that. No, that's great. I'm the techie in my family. You yeah, know? but it makes more sense you'd in think your the, case. You'd think the young people would know something about technology because they grew up well, with I'm, it. It's not the case. Well, not in our house. Not they many houses. Have the stuff. They use. They, they have use the it. Here. They have Snapchat. They have Facebook. They know how to use it. Sure. But they don't know how to support it. They didn't have to. It all came yeah, ready made it, for them. Right, but they dump it on me, and I was <laughs> computer phobe till like twenty years ago, and then I realized ripping the guts out of a desktops was the most 
cathartic and oh, nice. thing. And the, it was amazing. And oh, now awesome. I'm back to school to get my A+. Plus oh, my goodness. Education. So you're an IT professional. No, God, no. That's like my dream. On your way to an IT professional. Uh, but only where hardware's concerned. The software I get totally lost. That's a, another yeah. interesting kind of... Um, divide in the computer business there are people who are software only and people who are hardware only yeah, yeah. but it's the hardware that's getting me down right now what's the matter so my daughter has an asus vivo book max yeah uh, she bought it in december 2017 and it, over the last year it's taken to crashing periodically well troubleshooting whenever it would happen and it got to the point where it was only crashing when it wasn't plugged in, even though the battery said it was fully charged. I'm sure it's the battery. I've talked to the people at ASUS, and they say, well, sure, send it to us. Yeah. Send us $60. Yeah. <laughs> we'll diagnose this, and if you like our diagnosis, you know, then we'll fix it. But I just want to replace the battery, and I've been told by a lot of people, if you can't get an OEM battery... Just get a new computer. So this is this, the this, generic batteries right. for anything just really aren't worth the money. This comes down to a much larger battle that's going on. There's a movement called the right to repair movement. You own this piece of hardware, your phone, your laptop. You, you own it. You bought it outright. They don't they're not lending it to you. But right. many companies and Apple is the forefront of this. Uh, Asus actually is pretty good, but it doesn't matter. Many companies don't want you to open up their devices. Apple really never has wanted you. Going back to the earliest days of the Macintosh, Steve Jobs put proprietary screws in the Macintosh, hoping no one would figure out how to get in, right? But I, bought, I, I have those tools. Yeah, the Torx wrench, yeah. So yeah. This, is, this is really annoying. Apple is fighting. There are right-to-repair uh, bills in many states. Apple fights them state by state. Uh, they have some crazy idea that, oh, if we let people into our computers, they'll hack them. I don't know what it is. They want to control it. They want to have all the repairs go through the Apple store, and they don't sell parts. And that's the key, right? They don't. Not only do they not offer manuals, they don't sell right. parts. So the right to repair movement says there, need, there ought to be a law requiring yeah. companies that sell equipment to sell also at parts and manuals so that there can be an aftermarket repair business. This battle is being fought right now. Uh, ah. I don't know for a fact whether Asus offers its batteries. Apparently it doesn't. Is that the case? Generally, it, it, it doesn't. And yet I'm finding batteries online that claim the people selling them claim to be OEM. Yeah, this uh, is the... Okay, so now this is another the, problem. But none, of those ba but none of those batteries are, are the ones for my daughter's laptop. Yeah, so. this is another problem. So Asus certainly would be the best place to get this. It's a Taiwanese company. They have manufacturing standards. A lot of the batteries of, of all kinds, the lithium-ion batteries you'll find online on Amazon or other places, are made by third parties. Right. Some with better standards than others. I don't know if you're in your A-plus studies you've ever come across a punctured lithium-ion battery. No. They're well, explosive. They're explosive. Oh. The chemistry inside a lithium-ion battery, if exposed to air, will burst into flames and explode, spewing toxic chemicals in every direction. They're dangerous. Right. They can explode if they're punctured, but they can also explode if they are overcharged. They will swell uh -huh. and then, uh, because they're swelling, exceed the capacity of their container and explode through the wall and that's very dangerous. Remember those hoverboards that burst into flames? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to be banned. So this is the problem. Right. A well-manufactured lithium-ion battery has circuitry to prevent overcharging. Right. Asus's for sure do. Apple's do. IBM's do. Everybody, you know, the big companies do. The problem is if you go online, you don't know where you're getting it. It could be a factory in Shenzhen that is not, you know, making these batteries properly. Just as mm -hmm. with the hoverboards, that's what went wrong with the hoverboards. They overcharged and exploded. And right. so now I think it's less of a problem. Uh, there are some names, third party battery names, that are reliable and trustworthy. And that's what I was hoping you could help me with. Well, I, again, I don't know. 
uh, with these Asus batteries. I buy uh, lithium-ion batteries from a Chinese company called Anchor all the time. Very reliable. Aukey, A-U-K-E-Y, very reliable. I don't know, though, if they make these re VivoBook replacements. I just don't know. That's probably not a big enough category for there to be a lot of uh -huh. them. I will use third-party batteries in my cameras reliably. Right. Um, right. So you just you got to pay attention and be careful. And if it's a cheap battery, it's probably not worth it. Is it easy uh -huh. to get into the Vivo book? Have you looked at the screws and all that? Oh, I've uh, I've cracked it open. Okay, so, so you see where the battery goes, and you can see that you can easily it's unplug so it. Deep down inside, it's not it's not even funny. That's the other problem. So some laptops, like my ThinkPads, one of the reasons I buy ThinkPads, easy to open up, easy to replace the battery. It's just a connector. Yeah. It's not glued in. Apple glues right. Apple glues its batteries to the keyboard. You yeah, can't I noticed that. Yeah. I noticed that. Yeah. That annoys the heck out of me. It's not good practice. No. But it's what they do. And so this is the issue too, is you don't know that Vivo book is inexpensive. It's very compact. It may well be. It's not it it isn't re repairable. That may well be the problem. I, you know, and the good news is I can talk to you like this because you clearly understand all these issues. So, Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I would be pr proceed with prudence and caution. I would consider how hard it's going to be to get that thing apart because, well, and this, I learned this as a kid. I used to like to take apart watches, but I could never get them put back together. Well, I've taken this uh, laptop apart two or three times. Oh, good. Okay. So you've been in there. Yeah. Um, it, you, you've got to take out everything to include the hard drive. Yeah, they don't make it easy it before you can get to the battery. Good, so you know you can do that, and you know you can get it back together again. I would say, you know, shop carefully, read reviews. It's fine to buy a third-party battery if it's exactly the same. It's got to be completely one hundred percent compatible. And then, even then, the first twenty times you charge that laptop, keep an eye on it. If it starts to smoke or swell or get hot unplug it so i i use third-party batteries but it but it is absolutely the case that they can be dangerous and that's the reason the lack of proper circuitry to prevent overcharging but on the you know and actually 60 bucks that's not a lot of money i think asus it might be prudent just to get it from asus if they wanted 600 bucks that's how much the laptop cost but 60 bucks that's not so bad Hey, it was a pleasure talking to you, Lori. I hope this helps. 8888-ASK-LEO. Obviously, I'm a big fan of the Right to Repair movement. Righttorepair.org if you are interested. It's a worthy cause. Hey, our show today brought to you by Ahrefs. Oh, man, I love this. In fact, I know a lot of you have, have taken advantage of this Ahrefs offer and are loving it. Thank you for doing that. For those of you who don't know, Ahrefs is a... SEO tool set, not an SEO agency, but a company that gives you information and tools to help you rank your website in Google, which is, if you have a website, probably the most important job, right? To get it up there in the search results. Href is incredible. They make competitive analysis easy with tools to show you how your competitors are getting traffic from Google and what you can do to compete. You'll see the pages and the content that send your competitors the most traffic. Yep, that's public information. If you have the right tool, you can find it. You can find out the exact keywords they're ranking for, which backlinks are helping them rank. And from there, you can replicate on their strategies or improve on it and improve your rank. If you're not getting significant search traffic, they help you find the topics worth creating pages or content on. You can easily see estimated search volumes, gauge traffic potential with their Keywords Explorer tool. This, you know, I've often made fun of SEO snake oil, but this is real stuff, getting information that Google offers, extracting it for your competitor's site, for your site, and helping you strategize. This is the real deal. This really works. And if you already are getting search traffic, you, you can get data like their top pages report that breaks down which of your pages are bringing in the most traffic, so you can do more like that. They have a, a lot of free resources. They have a blog and a YouTube channel, lots of tutorials there. It's a, it, now, the only thing that's confusing is it's ahrefs.com. It's a little, it's an internet pun. It's an HTML pun. Ahrefs.com, ahrefs.com. They pronounce it ahrefs. They spell it ahrefs. And they have a seven-day trial for seven bucks, which, you, I mean, that's a no-brainer. you got to try it. Seven-day trial, seven bucks, ahrefs, ahrefs.com to sign up.
This, they came to us and said, you know, we want people to know about us. And I was thrilled because it's really cool. It's really cool. This is the kind of SEO I believe in. Ahrefs, A-H-R-E-F-S dot com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo, the phone number, line three. Alex Rancho Cucamonga. Hello, Alex. <clears throat> Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? I want to know how to make YouTube videos, just rudimentary ones. And I'm just like, I, I, was, I watch the YouTube videos sometimes just for the sake of just watching how they do it. That's a great you way know, to start. Know. That's actually a really good idea for starting because there is a some certain these, aesthetic. I'm just going for simple, but some of them are just wonderful. I yeah. Mean, I can see that this is way above me and yeah. it's actually getting into, I would have to actually learn a whole new discipline and I don't have time for it. Yeah. And I started what, a little. So the first thing to ask is what's your purpose in making YouTube videos? I am self-employed and I made, I, I started a little tool manufacturing company for my industry. Cool. And um, I got a bank account. I got a DBA. I have, um, I've sold some and I want to grow. And I was thinking I, I need a website. So before that, I needed to populate the website. And I'm trying to think about this and I need to make videos that show how it's used because Perfect. a lot of people wouldn't Perfect. even know what to do with Perfect. it. Perfect. So there, there then, are many, as you probably noticed as you browse around YouTube, there are many categories of videos on YouTube. You know, some of them are intended to be viral. I just read an article in the New York Times about a guy who's been making YouTube videos, a Japanese fellow has been making YouTube videos for almost as long as YouTube's been around of him playing with cats, feeding cats. And now you'd think, oh, cat videos, those are going to be viral as heck, right? He's got no more than 100 subscribers. Most videos have four or five views. And yet every day he posts a video of him feeding a cat or playing with a cat. This is a guy who's determined. However, not achieving YouTube success in the normal sense of the word. But on the other hand, neither do you. Your goal is not... To, I mean, it is a marketing tool, right? That's part of it. But it's I also just link the vi yeah. I you want to link the videos on the website? Yeah, you have. This is another very yeah. viable category in YouTube: how-to videos. My son learned how to cook from YouTube videos. Everybody I know, it, when somebody calls and says, "As our last call, I did. How do I open this laptop? Re replace the battery?" I will say, "Go to YouTube. There will undoubtedly yeah. be a video of somebody doing that. The quality, who cares?" It doesn't matter as long as you can. It, here's the key for you it's and for content. It, it, content. And it has to be legible. I have to be able to understand you. You can't have terrible audio because if the even if the video is good, if the audio is annoying in terms of low quality or bad music, <laughs> that's bad too, right? So don't put music on it. Way too many people put music on their videos. If there's no audio, don't put any audio. I think you simply narrating it would be plenty. Do you now you have probably exactly what you need right now to make good YouTube videos? Do you have a, a late model smartphone? I do. I have a Note 8, and I've been uh, looking at getting a gimbal, and then I have a GoPro Hero 4. Oh, you're which set. Is the most you newest don't, one, but it's great. Don't go crazy on all the gear yet. You'll know later what you might need. You might actually need lights before you need something else. The gimbal might be useful. The gimbal's great if you're moving around a lot, but you're doing videos of repairs. You may not need a gimbal. You Maybe you want a locked-down camera more than the gimbal. What are you repairing? No, no, it's... It's how to use a tool. Right, it, right. And, and it's to do with flooring. Oh, okay. So, I've, I've so honestly, flooring. if, if it, put your, what you're doing, put yourself in your customer's shoes. This is true, by the way. No matter what you're doing on radio, TV, YouTube, it's the most important thing to do. It's the thing, often I look at videos and listen to people on the radio and wonder, what are you thinking? The only thing to be thinking of is what does my customer want? What does my viewer want? What does my listener want? You're, Get to the point. Yeah, yeah. you're selling to a floor, uh, I presume a, floor, a guy who does flooring. Is that right? I don't. Right. Doesn't matter. But we, think about what that guy wants. He wants clear, 
straightforward, get to the point, don't waste my time video of how to use this tool to do this job. So the gimbal, the wide-angle GoPro, that may not be the key. The, may, the real thing may be well-lit so you can see what's going on, close-up of the tool doing the thing. And if, if maybe a little text, if it would be helpful to say, don't forget to make sure that the join is faced to the left so that the tool goes to the right, or whatever it is, maybe that, maybe your narration... But that's who you got to think about, and it doesn't mean well, you're naming it. You're aiming it at a 15 year old YouTube freak. That's a different audience. You're aiming it at a floor. You know those guys. They're your customer. If I may ask, though, it's the software that's challenging me because you already have that too. To, you already have that too on your phone yeah, because everyone's saying that I have to invest like thousand no, no, dollars in nuts. all these uh, things no. and. No, no, you can. And, if you have a Mac or a Windows machine, both of them have good. You see. Okay, I, there's great video editors that are free. Don't pay more than 100 bucks for a video editor if you really want a, a good one, Adobe Premiere Elements, under 100 bucks. It'll, it'll let you make I'm DVDs. <laughs> yeah, Premiere is great. It'll let you make DVDs as well if you want to do that. But it'll edit the video and upload it to YouTube. But even your, cam your phone, the Samsung, has video editing software on it. That's good. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So the key... The key is, don't. it's so tempting, I do this too, to go out and spend a lot of money up front. That's, you don't know what you need yet. What, but what you need to do more than anything is think about what, your, what the job of this video is. And that's the, Are we off the air now? Yeah, but we're still on the podcast, oh. so there's still people listening. Oh, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you. Because sure. The, I was waiting, and I was thinking when Leo comes on, I better hit him with some good questions. And I don't want <laughs> no, no, no. There's no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. I've, I've uh, I, some of the people that I watch, uh, it, um, they sit at their command center and show you how they make their videos, um, and they're wonderful. And and the 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 operation they have is is leading edge, and I. I, you, I was hoping for something simple, and then you I, don't need to do I Marcus Lee Brownlee. And, you don't. Marcus Brownlee goes out. He buys five K red cameras, or better. He get. I mean, but that's for him. This is his. To this is his hobby. This is his joy. He actually over. It, many of these guys, it's overkill. You don't need any of that. You've got your Samsung phone is all you need. That's a great camera. You probably don't need a gimbal. What you might want to get is something just to hold it steady. Uh -huh. And get in close, and you might want to get a light. Go to the hardware store and get a work light. And yeah. you, you'll see as you position it around when it's too bright, too dark, you want to have it so they can clearly see what you're doing. Um, the mic on the phone is fine for audio, but if you, you know, if what you'll. What you'll notice is you just put yourself in your customer's position. You don't, it should be short, sweet, to the point. I, I was visualizing, like, to put a name on it, you know, or maybe an arrow pointing to something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inserts like this. That's as much as I need. That's all you need. And I think annotation capability is really great. Samsung is phones. What's that called? Yeah, okay. it's called annotation. Um, Samsung phones come with a video editor that will do that. Um, there are many video editors in the Play Store, so you could do it on the phone. It's a little hard to do that on the phone. You probably want to do it on your PC. I'd rather. Yeah. Yeah. So you could do it on your PC. Um, I honestly, you could do it. Uh, like I said, Premiere, but there, uh, you don't even. There are plenty of free programs. Avid, which is the kind of the king of the hill for professional video editors, offers a free version for Windows. A V I D. Avid. That's probably uh, more editor. Yeah, that's probably more than you need to be honest. Um, that's it's kind of overkill. Um, what would be chat room? What would be a good if he wants to do titles and 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 maybe an arrow pointing at stuff, I don't know what would be a good. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. I'll, when it when I get this content and I want to make the website, is the Wix and GoDaddy the next step? Or no, God, I hate them both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guide me because I, I I have to do this. This is this is Premier Rush. Of where Premier I'm going. is Premier offers Rush. That's their new Adobe Rush is their new video editor. I forgot about that. 
<laughs> that is both mobile and on the desktop. And I think that's a very simple, they're trying to make something anybody could use. So if you search for Adobe Premiere Rush. Okay, I'm writing that down. That's that's the uh, new that's the new Premiere Elements. That's a really good choice. And you can do it they have a they have it on the phone, they have it on a tablet and they have it on Windows. So you can do it in all three places. Excellent. Um that's the one I would absolutely go with. Uh I don't think it's too expensive. Um and then uh, I'm sorry, what what did you ask before I said that? Uh the the website. Oh, the I website. Was looking at Look at the next look at be populating a website. Yeah, uh, look at Squarespace or WordPress. I like them both, and you can register the domain name through them. And then I'm not a geek. I'm, I mean, I'm geeky, but I'm not a website person. I'll be able to do this myself. Yes, I got to run now. Sorry, photo guy Chris Marquart is here. You make videos, don't you, Chris? Uh, yeah, I do. You make great Every now videos and then. of your. Uh, photo safaris and so forth he does some great workshops at discover the top floor.com what do you use for your uh, videos oh whatever i get my hands on <laughs> it doesn't really <laughs> it's precious. i think we focus a little I'm, too much on the tools you say that all the time with cameras yeah no i i, I shoot i shoot a lot with the iphone now because it has 4k video it does it makes it gets good yes. colors if I, if i need shallow depth of field i will go to my dslrs but that is way more setup needs way more post-processing so if it's just a quick video where i want to show people how awesome my my photo tours are so they come and sign up for the next one then very often it's iphone footage because it makes things look so good and that's true with most other other smartphones as well. So, yeah. isn't that I amazing? Now you have yeah. in your pocket a device that's more than adequate for almost everything anybody would want to do, even it's for YouTube videos. Shocking! For it's yeah. it's especially shocking for the professionals who <laughs> spent a lot have of a money, big investment in all their big uh, cameras. And, don't uh, get me started. Yeah, yeah. we bought. Uh, <laughs> we yeah we we shoot our video with basically consumer grade camcorders but we bought 40 of them when they when we started and that was more than $40,000 yeah. worth of camera gear anyway i don't want to talk about it let's talk about our photo <laughs> assignment what was the assignment this month chris well, the assignment was door the letter d in the alphabet and we have received 48 submissions and uh there are no flickr group and i have made a selection of 3 of them that we We'll have a quick look Lots at Lots of great doors. All right. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I love these. I mean, these these are listener supplied assignments, right? We have on the on the Flickr group, on the Tech Guy group on Flickr, oh, we have I this discussion one. thread where other listeners will will submit ideas for the next assignment. And uh, listener Demilente had this idea of going by the alphabet. So uh, she's been um, supplying several of these so far and uh yeah so d d as in door and the first one that i selected is by paddy jerdine jerdine door to the past and it's uh what we see is well <laughs> what's left of a of a cabin somewhere out in in the prairie somewhere with mountains in the back background and i like this because there's a story in it. This house, this little cabin has seen a lot of things. And now it's only like a, I just love a skeleton this. of itself. What and the door, shot. I mean, you, you have to look at the door because the door is normally that shows either. If you look from the outside, it shows the inside. If you look from the inside, it shows the outside. But you are outside and you see the outside. So there's no back wall. And that kind of makes this an interesting thing to look at. It's unusual. Nice job. Really nice job. Second one is by okay. You help me pronounce that name, Mevins. Me, yeah, I'd say uh, Mevins. Me, Mevins. Yeah. Mevins. Yeah. Uh, titled "Pick Any Door." By the way, thanks for putting a title on that. <laughs> um, it's uh, in the description: the Marion Power Shovel Building in Marion, Ohio. And I, it's just it, it's 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 a frontal picture on a wall that has a staircase going up and then there's three doors on it one on the top where that staircase goes to then there's a fire escape going upwards then there's a, a kind of a garage door for the down um, that has something in front of it and then there's a third door for people again 
And I just like the the the, the strict geometry of it. Yeah, the it, geometry if, jumps out at you. And that's why I like it, it being black and white. I think that's really nice. It really helps see the geometry. Yeah. And the only thing, I mean, this is being nitpicky, but the only thing I would have straightened it just a little more because right along the edges of the picture, you can see that it's slightly skewed. Yeah. And with any modern photo editing software, you it's a click of a button and it's totally straight because that was obviously the intention. That was the intention. Yeah, it's about geometry, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. is about geometry. And shapes. Even the numbers, you know, are very graphic. Even the 67, 90, 91, yeah. Yeah. there's like stuff that you can recognize and yeah. it, yeah, nice I like it. Really nice. Mevins. Finally. And the third one by Alex Zarnowski, Escaping Through the Fire Exit. So what we see is a, a color picture. <laughs> it's... Very colorful. It, it's very colorful. It's uh, obviously uh, we're looking through a door. Um, actually, we're looking through two doors because there's a, a, a grating, and then there's a there's another door, and we're looking inside. Uh, it's a restaurant kitchen, I would say, in a back alley somewhere. And uh, the door and the wall, everything is red. And uh, inside the kitchen, you see a, a guy um, who obviously works there, and then there's a lady sitting right close to the camera and I don't know, she might be sad. She, she has her hand in her, uh, her face in her hand. She might be sad. She must might be taking a rest. She might be thinking about something. There's so many po possible stories in there that you will tell yourself when you look at that picture. I like the colors. I like the color contrast. I like the saturation of it. Um, it's a story picture that has two very prominent doors in it. It's great street and, uh, photography, really like too. It. I mean, obviously yes. taken from the street. I, I think that uh, there are three elements in here I like. The red is predominant, and red's always a great yes. color, right? The The words fire exit begin the story, and then the woman <laughs> sitting with her head in her hand, kind of outside. She's even wearing a red cap, a New York Yankees cap. There is This is a story for sure. You know something is going on, and you, yes. get, to, and you get to use your... Uh, imagination that's that's a great great photo and and the story catches the moment where the guy inside the building catches yeah. the photographer yeah so yeah there's that's to it because he looks at you yeah. so there's nice. a lot going on here what a fun fun photo three great ones boy we had a great uh, submissions today oh yes Wow. Oh yes, so we are. This this is working so so great. A, we are B, continuing C, the alphabet. We must be on E. e. Now. e. So we have several submissions. Uh, Chip CDM submitted exception. Demilente submitted eyes. Uh, Briano two thousand seven submitted engine. But the one I will go with for this assignment is by Birenamin, <laughs> and it's electric. 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 That's appropriate electric. for the tech guy. Oh, yeah. And electric. Yeah. All right. So here's how this works. You have about a month to take a picture. We'd like you to take brand new pictures. Don't go through your collection. This is really the object of this. Is That's not a contest. There's no prize. The object is just an excuse to go take pictures. So uh, think in your mind, electric. Where can I take some pictures that illustrate the concept electric? Um, and as you can see, it doesn't matter whether you use a camera phone or a fancy f camera. That's not the point. Uh, Chris is going to pick three in about a month. He'll talk about them. The way you submit them, take the pictures, tag them TG Electric. That's the tag because Flickr is all tag driven. Uh, Flickr is our uh, the website we use. It's a free site. Love it. Was a Yahoo site for a long time. If you had a Yahoo account, you probably still have a Flickr account. Smug Monk owns it now. Love them even more. Love the McCaskills. So uh, go to flickr.com. If you're not signed up, sign up. Join the Tech Guy group. About 11,000 people in there. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will welcome you. And you, have, you can submit as many as four photos. One per week each week. Renee will accept them. But make sure you put the, uh, the tag TG Electric so we know in about a month, which ones are uh, submissions. And Chris will pick three. You can find Chris at his website, discoverthetopfloor.com. When's your next uh, workshop? Coming up soon? Um, in fall, Romania, but then next year, the ones I'm really proud of uh, are next year. In, in uh, well, winter, we go to like Baikal, the oh, big boy. ice journey, they driving were. on the lake. And oh, man. Some if others. you want to get better at photography, see the world, and travel with a great group of people, discoverthetopfloor.com. Thanks, Chris. We'll see you next week. Leo Laporte, Thank you. the tech guy.
Some really nice images this time. Wow. I was impressed by all of them. Really you know stuff. what I what I think the 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 simplicity of the assignment yeah. um, it encourages takes, people. takes yeah yeah it, it takes the fear factor out of it. People are not as as oh my god my picture is going to be in, in the public because I see I see this a lot even on even on workshops. I often have people who have never shown their photography to anyone else so it's kind of scary for them first yeah. time having like a picture yeah. up on the wall everyone critiquing it. Yeah. Um, that fades pretty quickly, but the the initial like yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. So really nice. It helps. It helps to kind of keep this very very simple, and the results are awesome. There's a lot of great photos in there. The choices are getting the the choice is getting more difficult I over bet time. It is. Yeah. Thank you to everybody yes. who participated. That's really really great stuff. Yeah, I see the uh, fire exit guy does a lot of uh, street photography. It looks like in Chinatown in New York. It's really nice. Probably stuff. yeah. Really nice stuff. Yeah. Really, cool. I, I I guess I might even have come across that. Yeah, yeah. I just was looking at his other stuff. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. We get back to the phones and talk to Josh in Austin, Texas. Hello, Josh. Hello. How are you today? I am well. How are things in Austin? Not too bad. Not too bad. Good. Good. I am about to pull out my hair. Uh-oh. I've got an old laptop, and it is driving me nuts. I've got a Dell 6530 that I'm working on for somebody. Okay. And no matter what I try, I cannot get rid of Trend Micro. Oh. For the machine. Yeah, so this is uh, adware, basically. Um, Trend gives money to Dell, saying... If you'd put a trial version on your uh, on your computers, uh, we would be very happy. And here's twenty dollars. And Dell, yeah. who wants to get the price as low as they can, said, "Okay." And that's why you have a number of different trialware programs on your computer. Microsoft hates this, by the way, because people think it's part of Windows. They don't understand it's something Dell's doing. And in fact, Microsoft created a program called the Signature PC program. Uh, and you could sell these computers and even sell them at a slightly higher price saying they don't have any crapware on them. But nobody wa nobody, but nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I, if, if, if you can, I always get a signature PC. However, removing these things is possible. So the Trend Micro is, it's by the way, it's a very competent antivirus. I just don't generally use an antivirus on Windows 10 because it comes with one. That is just as competent. Why have two? So right. removing an antivirus, though, is usually not as easy as just doing an uninstall. Nope. And even even in safe mode, I can't get rid of yeah. it. Yeah, and there's a good reason for that. If if it were easy, then the bad guy, this is one reason I don't like antiviruses, would just remove the antivirus and then enter your computer. You know, they, they don't want it to be too easy. The good news is... Uh, in almost every case, these companies, Norton does the same thing, McAfee does the same thing. They offer special removal tools for this. So if you go to Trend Micro's support pages, you could just Google Trend Micro uninstall tool. They have a special uninstall tool. And then they have more information about addition, you know, how to remove leftover stuff. So that's the place to go is their Trend Micro support forums. And you're going to need to use, you can't just do the the Windows uninstaller. You have to use their uninstall tool. You won't need to go into safe mode, I don't think. Um, you just need to use their tool. And that is all, all antiviruses do it now. And it's just because they want to make it hard to re remove them. You know, they don't want bad guys to take them out. But I think you're that right to remove sense. it. I see no, re I mean, trend is fine. It's a very good antivirus. I don't dislike them. But I just don't see any reason to have third-party antiviruses on a Windows 10 machine. It comes no, with an antivirus. It, it, it makes it difficult because uh, trying to do some work it gets in the way. All, yeah. It's yeah. Like, no. Yeah. It gets. Here's okay. Here's the arguments against a third-party antivirus. First of all, they don't work well enough. Uh, best antiviruses maybe 50 percent, and they're never going to catch the most dangerous viruses, which are. The zero days, the ones that no one knows about. It's zero days because it, at the same time people learn about it, it's hitting people. No antivirus can handle that, or very few anyway. So that's problem one. You're going to get viruses even if you have an antivirus. So 
that that leads to problem 1A, which is overconfidence. Oh, I have an antivirus. I don't have to worry. No, you still have to worry. You still have to do the same things you do if you didn't have an antivirus. Problem two is that antiviruses in general operate at a low level in the operating system, which means if there's anything wrong with the antivirus, they provide a beautiful highway for bad guys right into your computer. And we've seen this happen with Norton and McAfee and others that 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 if they if there are any flaws in the antivirus, they're actually a better vector for for viruses. You're actually giving viruses better access. So that's a bad reason to have an antivirus, right? <laughs> Give bad guys bad access, better access. So for those two reasons, and then there's the third reason, which you've already pointed out, which it makes operation often more difficult. Sometimes you can't get online because the security software is blocking it. It, it's just an, an extra pain. And the good news is because Microsoft puts Windows Defender into Windows 10, it comes with an antivirus, you've, you've already got as much protection as you'd get from any antivirus. They do something no one else does, I think more companies will start to do, which is they sandbox their antivirus. There's never been, to my knowledge, a problem with Microsoft's antivirus in terms of exploits. But if there were, you'd still be safe because they, they isolate it from the rest of the system, which is great. It's, it's the safest antivirus to use. So just use that. And you still have to be careful. You still have to do the right thing. If you have a business, you have to train your staff not to open uh, phishing emails, things like that. So, yeah, they the, the trend micro calls it the TI150 underscore win underscore EN tool underscore uninstall tool HFP005.exe. And they offer it on their site. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to use. <laughs> <laughs> to, get, to get rid of the virus. Max Riverside, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Max. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Doing very well. So I have uh, connectivity issues with my current Wi-Fi, and I'm moving. We're buying a, a house that's about 1,700 square feet. Okay. It's brick walls. Oh. I would, was thinking about getting a mesh network. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. So yeah. here's here's what's happened. Is you know, it's not that houses are bigger or they're built more robustly. It's just that we're doing more with Wi-Fi. We're watching you know Netflix in the living room. The kids are watching YouTube. Somebody else doing email. And then there's the neighbors. They have Wi-Fi too, and they're busy with Wi-Fi. So you get more interference. You're taxing it more. So the way we use Wi-Fi has changed an awful lot. And I think mesh is a, a attempt to answer this. In the old days, if you had a 1,700 square foot is not too big for the old-fashioned single router model. But And brick isn't necessarily bad. Metal is the worst. So if it's reinforced with metal, that's bad. Uh, well, the house was built in the 60s. Yeah, so uh, it probably has some metal on the walls. Um, my son is a big gamer. Yeah, uh, there you go, it, right? Yeah. It, and he can't afford any latency. Yeah. <laughs> so what Mesh does, the old days, maybe if you had a big house, you'd have a base unit, and then you'd buy an extender, right, and put it in the... That's not so great because the extender cuts the speed in half because half the time it's talking to you, but half the time it's talking back to the base station. It operates in half duplex. That's not good. Mesh operates in full duplex it can do both it could talk to the base station and you at the same time so it doesn't slow you down they also most of the mesh solutions and everybody offers them now use software to try to understand to bandwidth shape to say well your son he needs very low latency you're watching netflix you don't care about latency but you want consistency you don't want to drop packets and the and and it, you know your your sister in the in the bedrooms doing email she she's got no she doesn't she's not in a hurry at all and no it'll try to shape the bandwidth they also have additional features almost all the mesh uh, providers offer you know anti malware sol solutions and other things for additional prices um, Eero longtime sponsor has always been one of my favorites I used Eero uh, for a long time at home. Um, I think they make an excellent product. Remember, these are going to cost more than you're used to spending because you're getting one base station and usually one or two. You probably don't need more than a, a base station and an external unit. I also love Orbeez. These are Netgears. Uh, I think the Orbe does a very good job. Many people rate it as the fastest. So uh, I think Orbe might be a good choice, especially for 1,700 square feet. You don't need more than two units, a base station and a remote. My internet connection is going to be 400 megabytes per nice. second. Nice. 
Nice. Hang on for a second. I got to take a break. I'll talk to you off the air, though. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I mean, you're probably not going to get 400 megabits on your Wi-Fi because just Wi-Fi doesn't go that fast. But you'll, right. and you'll get hundreds. The, the ones that have the, the LAN ports in them, how you can uh, just like hardwire the TV in the living room so that the yeah, so whatever. If it's if if almost all of them now have uh, like the ORB have Ethernet ports in the satellite units, but the satellite is still talking via Wi-Fi. So while you're hardwired to the satellite, you're still really using Wi-Fi. If you want full throughput on Ethernet, you're going to be you want to attach to the base unit, which is attached to your router. You want to be hardwired all the way, and I do. That's what I do. My TV. Okay, and what about uh, I have a lot of Samsung products. Uh, Robovac TVs. This is why you need mesh. This is exactly it. You got a hundred devices in your house connecting to the internet. Right, and we want to put uh, internet, uh, the Wi-Fi uh, door lock, door, yep. you know, the yep. video cameras, lights. Yep. Uh, that's what, that's what, what this is for. Best? Well, I okay, I'm we using I use both Eero and Orbi in my house because I have two uh, internet providers. Um, both of them work great for this. Orbi's a little faster, in my experience. Eero does more to bandwidth shape. There's a there's another feature I didn't really get time to mention, which is all these companies, if you get it from a good company, and certainly a Netgear and a Eero account, give you regular updates. So you're always getting patches, but you're also often getting new features. And And some people don't like this. They are monitoring your traffic. So they will bandwidth shape and they will give you firmware updates and they'll say, okay, well, I see you have all of these Internet of Things devices. They don't need high-speed connectivity. Oh, except for that one. That's a camera. So we'll make sure that the vacuum cleaners, they get, you know, a little bit of bandwidth. The camera gets more bandwidth. Your son gets the best bandwidth, that kind of thing. And they are, they are constantly updating. So you'll, get, you'll see with all of these systems, they get better over time. I and they're think, all uh, with the Amazon Alexa, they're compatible? Yep. I what use, about the Samsung Smart Things? Yep. I use, I, have, I you know, they're all, anything that uses Wi-Fi, they're, they're, they're standard Wi-Fi. In fact, one of the things I love about Echoes uh, with the Eero is I can say, uh, I have my son's stuff. You can, in, in most of these, you can assign devices to, to owners. So all of my son's, tablets and phone and computer is in the Michael account and I could say Echo pause Michael's internet and he's suddenly cut off it's great fun for the whole family <laughs> there would be war <laughs> yeah I usually go okay wait for it dad dad so <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but that's that, that big with, with that much bandwidth. I shouldn't have any problem with you. Should not. Above. You should be in golden situation. You might have to, and uh, that's another feature that mesh systems tend to have. They have apps, and sometimes the apps will help you in the placement of the satellite units. And you may be fiddling with that a little bit. You want to make sure all the satellites get a get a strong connection to the base station. So sometimes you have to move them around a little bit. You know, maybe it's it's, it's got to get around door, you know, through doors and around walls and stuff. And I noticed, like, the Samsung things, the saddle, they're uh, AC 1300s, but the previous version was higher. Yeah, they don't need a lot of they're bandwidth, left. right? All you're doing is saying, turn off light, <laughs> start vacuum. They don't need a lot of bandwidth. So uh, don't. they're all AC. The speed isn't important. Everything's 802.11 AC. That's the st current standard. Um, okay. Yeah, I think... I. I Honestly, for you, I think the Eero uh, would be fine, but I like the Orbi for gaming. And you can always get more satellites. So start with the base plus one. And if you find, oh, we got a dead spot out in the backyard or something, you can get another satellite. Orbi's the only one that makes an outdoor unit as well. Oh, that's interesting. I wanted to put yeah. my, uh, pool, my pool equipment on that, Perfect. Too. Okay, so you, you may not need it, but if you do, it's really nice to be able to put one outside. All right. Sounds great. Yeah, Thanks I think so you're going to like it. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches. 
888-ask Leo the phone number if you want to talk high tech. I'd love to talk with you. 888-827-5536. Hour number three of the Tech Guy Show for this weekend. And I'm going to go to line four. And Bruce, he's on the line from Carlsbad, California. Hi, Bruce. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? No, not bad. Uh, enjoying your show. Thanks for listening. Uh, I've been using the uh, Dell uh, Inspiring uh, yeah. for about 12 years now. And the first 10 years of it, I uh, used Vista. And then, you know, finally, Vista support stopped. And also, I thought I'd uh, go to... Uh, Windows Operating System 7, and uh, mm -hmm. I did that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I had done wait, wait, it. This is all the same Inspiron? You've had this for 12 years? Yes, that's correct. Wow. Uh, it's, uh, it's still working perfect. Still works. Yeah, yeah. 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 it works perfect. I yeah. just, uh, you know, replaced the battery a couple times and uh, also the hard drive once. Uh, and anyway, um, so I thought uh, I would go to uh, Windows 7, and I didn't want to pay that you know, retail price on it, especially since it was going out the door too. So I, I went, uh, I got the got a, a product key on uh, eBay, uh, less than five bucks, and then I bought an installation disc also on eBay, ten bucks or so, less well, it was about eight bucks, and uh, uh, worked perfect. And then. Uh, after a while, Windows 7 support stopped, and, or is going to stop, and so I bought Windows 10 doing using the same thing, same, uh, just buying the DVD on eBay, and uh, uh, fortunately, the product key from 7 worked for 10 as well. And uh, uh, I, I, the, uh, everything is working absolutely perfect, but I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, okay, uh, you go to if you want to do this using Amazon, and uh, you know Windows 10 is going to cost you about 135 bucks, That's including right. product That's key. That's right. Yep. And uh, Windows 7 is not <laughs> it's not exactly cheap either. But so um, uh, in addition to that, I thought, uh, oh, I don't need the Windows 7 anymore. The the installation DVD. Uh, and so I thought I'd get a couple bucks on uh, for it on uh, Craigslist. And uh, here's what I found. Uh, Windows, uh, okay, um, Amazon is does not uh, sell any of this stuff that I was, the, the, the method that I used, not available on Amazon. No, and, no. And, then, and in addition. Just, and by the way, you're extremely lucky. Because most of the time, people buy a five dollar serial number; it doesn't work. <laughs> well, By the way, that work, same yeah. the same people who sold you that serial number sold it to a hundred other people. Okay, you, and you were you were lucky because you were the first one to use it, and so you own it. All the other people tried to register their Windows, and it said, "No, sorry, it's already been used." Yeah, well, they remember the qualifying thing uh, saying that. It might not work. <laughs> no, no, no. They were saying that to, uh, to comply with eBay, you, we need, uh, you can also buy the hard disk, the inoperable hard That's disk. That's a lie all around. So here's the deal. Here's what usually happens. Uh, I don't, this is, you're just, you lucked out. I don't recommend it uh, because it often doesn't work. So Microsoft has a, uh, a server an authentication server that keeps track of who owns what. Each serial number is assigned to some specific hardware, and they, when they, when you install Windows, it actually goes out and looks at the network MAC address. It looks, we don't know exactly because Microsoft doesn't reveal it, but uh, we can assume it looks at the serial number of the motherboard, a variety of hardware features, and says this is the machine. It fingerprints the machine, and this machine is associated with this serial number, and that's that. At, from that point on, that serial number cannot be used on another machine. It won't be authenticated. You'll be able to use it, and after 30 days, it'll start to say, uh, give you a warning saying, hey, you know, it's not authentic. Um, it's going to slow down. Eventually, it'll just slow down and be unusable. You are the first one. You lucked out. Same well, thing with the, have, the media. They... Buying the media is meaningless. Microsoft lets you download it for free, I should point out. Uh, but that's meaningless because without a serial number, it doesn't do anything. Now, here's the good news. Once you've authenticated Windows 10, which you have, you know, you go into about this machine, it says authentic Windows 10. The serial number is no longer used. Microsoft just says, oh, yeah, that machine, that fingerprint is associated with a valid Windows 10 account. You're done. 
and Microsoft's not going to sell anymore. There's no Windows 11 coming. So that's it. You will continue to be able to upgrade that 12-year-old machine with Windows 10 for the rest of your life, and you, you skated. But, in like Flynn. <laughs> in like Flynn. But I don't recommend it, and certainly you know, you're running a big risk when you use it's – not, it's not that anything bad will happen to you. The risk is you'll lose 5 bucks. that it won't work. And the chances are higher that it won't work. Another scam, or it's not exactly a scam, another thing people used to do, they don't do it anymore because it doesn't work anymore, is uh, OEM machines would come with an OEM license key and a disk. And a lot of times they'd separate the hardware from the disk and license key and sell them both separately to make a little extra money. Uh, you know, they'd install Windows 10, they'd activate it on the machine, but then sell the license key and the, heart and the disk. And that wouldn't be worth anything either because it wouldn't be activated. Sometimes, you know, sometimes their authentication server doesn't do its job and it can't activate. Sometimes you get lucky. But uh, I wouldn't and, assume. And then strangely enough, I thought, well, I'd get a couple bucks for the old Windows uh, 7 installation disk off the Craigslist. So I placed an ad on it. And, uh, I, and somebody I, bought I, it? No, no. I specifically said uh, no... Uh, uh, there is no no product key. You have to have a product key. So I think yeah. I thought, oh, no, you're not ripping anybody off. They're just no, getting the no. physical media. Well, guess what? the The ad was flagged by Craigslist. Yeah. Microsoft. Uh, this is not. Microsoft doesn't want you doing this, and Craigslist may not want you to do it either. If they don't. I don't yep. know why. Well, I know why. Because people are going to buy it thinking they're getting a copy of Windows. And by the way, Microsoft, partly in response to this, if you if you go to Microsoft.com, you can get the Windows Media Creation Tool that will create an installer for any version of Windows that's currently supported. Cinevin is about to lose its, uh, its go out of lifetime in uh, January, but you, I believe can still download a copy of Windows 7 and install it. Um, Windows 10 for sure. And so you don't need the disks anymore. Microsoft does, I mean, I just, that's an old... I just wanted, I just wanted the disk. That's yeah, why I did it. I don't blame you. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's very handy to have. The problem yeah. is most computers don't have drives, any <laughs> optical drives anymore. So that, that's kind of you. You basically in like Flynn is a good way to describe it. You skated, and good for oh. you. Good on you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, it's not. It's not wrong. It's not a bad thing to do. I just. It's wrong for the seller. I would say who's selling you these $5 serial numbers because they know pr perfectly well that nine times out of ten they're not going to work. Uh, but, you know, you didn't get taken, so you're, you're okay. I wouldn't resell that serial number. <laughs> that would be wrong. That would be wrong. And I think that's probably why Craigslist uh, prevents that. Uh, 135 bucks is the current cost of a Windows 10 home disk. That seems pricey to me. Microsoft, there are a lot of little loopholes in this. Um, if you're running a version of Windows currently, you have an activation key for Windows 7. A lot of times you can use that, get Windows 10 downloaded from Microsoft, install it, use the Windows 7 active key, activation key. It will activate. And as I said, the, the, the magic is once you've got Windows 10 activated, you're done. And yeah, it seems hard to believe when Microsoft says that's it, that's the last version of Windows. I, you know, it's hard not to say in 2025... Microsoft's not going to come out with something called, I don't know, Windows and Doors Episode 11. I don't know. It's not that I don't believe Microsoft. It just seems odd. But, yeah, no, this, for, this is a company that for decades made its money by every five years selling a new version of Windows. They say, nope, not anymore. It's a new world. Microsoft plans to make its money on its cloud services, its uh, software to some degree, but not its operating systems. That's, that's kind of over. And you'll get an update every uh, every six months of Windows 10. In fact, they're pushing out the current fall uh, or spring update, and the fall update will be coming out. I don't know September or October. It's a, it's an interesting. I really even they don't even want to sell you Office anymore. They want to sell you a subscription. That's their preferred way to sell Windows and Office. 8888. Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a little break. Come back. More of your calls coming up. As always, the Tech Guy Podcast brought to you by LastPass, the last password manager you'll ever need. All you have to do is remember one password. LastPass will create long, strong passwords and remember them for you. And that's why we love LastPass. I've been using LastPass since they came out. Steve Gibson, 
talked to their creator, looked at all the source code. He gave it two thumbs up. Steve, our security guy, he recommends LastPass. We even use LastPass Enterprise in our business. And I'm so glad because the LastPass uh, folks have a new business lineup that's really cool. Three innovative products giving the administrators, your IT department, or you if you're the owner, like me, the control we need, but all the convenience users expect. And that's kind of the magic in, in password managers. Usually it's a trade-off, security and convenience. You get one. But in this case, more convenient and more secure. They have a new single sign-on technology in LastPass Enterprise, 1,200-plus pre-integrated apps. No more passwords, no more logins, just a single sign-on on your phone. Press a button, say, yeah, I'm in. And, and it's more secure and more easy to use. How is that possible? This is in addition to, of course, its industry-leading password management capabilities. So if the apps you're using support LastPass Enterprise SSO, it's golden. If they don't, you still use LastPass's password manager. LastPass Enterprise manages access for every entry point with one solution covering both SSO and those that aren't SSO. Oh, and then there's LastPass MFA, multi-factor authentication. So you've heard us talk about two-factor. This is mul this uses more than just a password in your fingerprint or a password and a, a code. It uses biometrics and factors like geolocation to combine into making an absolutely perfect identification. And this is all, what it's all about is authentication, making sure only the right users are accessing the right data at the right time. And it does, and that's great because it all works behind the scenes. It doesn't add complexity. It doesn't add inconvenience. It just adds security. That's LastPass MFA. They combine the two into LastPass Identity. So you get LastPass Enterprise, LastPass MFA. And as far as we're concerned, from the IT department's point of view, you get a holistic view of end-user activity from one dashboard that covers everything, passwords, authentication, even all apps in use. So you really have your thumb uh, your finger on what's going on, on the pulse of your business. From single sign-on and password management to adaptive authentication, LastPass Identity gives granular control to IT and frictionless control to users. Users are happy. You're happy. It's a win-win. We use it here. I can't wait to get it started. LastPass is bridging the gap between access and authentication to simply and securely manage identity. That's what it's all about. Join over 13.5 million people who've signed up for LastPass and are loving and trusting it. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. Lastpass.com slash twit. I hope I'm not giving away a secret, but come October, we're going out to LastPass in Boston. We're going to do a special event on authentication. Uh, Steve Gibson's going to join us. We're going to talk about Squirrel. We're going to talk about all the issues with authentication. We're going to get some security experts. It's going to be a lot of fun. LastPass is sponsoring the trip. We're going to make a special out of it. And if you're in the uh, on the East Coast, keep it, uh, keep your eye peeled for the full announcement coming in October because I'd love to see you all out there. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think they have a – Lisa was saying, I can't remember. Was it? It's a big – I think it's a theater that can hold a few people. So that will be a lot of fun. That's coming in oct early October. Thank you, LastPass, for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm going to talk over these lyrics as fast as I can so you don't hear what he's saying because I don't think it's appropriate for the tech man. 8888, ask Leo. Big Pee Wee, musical director. Love the, love the music. Always do. Uh, Sam on the line from Eugene, Oregon. Hey, Sam. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for all your tech deciphering service. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. It wouldn't be silly for me to sit here talking to myself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've been listening for over a decade to what you do wow. on the network. Pretty amazing Thank stuff. Thank you. Uh, all the security now and all the, you know, come and gone shows and, you know, I could bemoan some of the missing stuff, but I love the stuff that's still coming oh, out. I and really appreciate it. I got a question about my phone and and Google and Gmail, you know, it was a long time since CompuServe and simple email, and, and, and what I assumed was just an ASCII format, just send in a bunch of ASCII text, and there it is. Well, now, you know, I've always disabled images, because I learned way back. Smart that, man. You know, if I did that, I'm, av I'm avoiding tracking, yep. uh, you know, the pixels and yep. so on and so forth. But I noticed in this last year or so that whenever I, I've ha I haven't had the images on for 10 years in my Gmail, and, you know, 
advertisers not paying attention to this because some of them come up absolutely empty and then smarter ones they have the body so it kind of shows what it is that it would be there you know that's the smarter advertiser but the problem i'm seeing now is every time i turn on a, or open up an email i see a flash of the entire image that would be loaded and is loaded when i press display images yeah. so it appears to me as if google yeah. is just yeah. using up my bandwidth anyway backloading yeah. this image <laughs> And probably yeah. uh, working those tracking they sure are champ and whatnot. Yeah. So this is a really uh, boy. This is a great topic, and it, it kind of is timely because I don't know if you remember, but there was a a couple of weeks ago a big furor over an email service, uh, paid email service that would put a one by one, basically invisible pixel in the email, and they would use this to let the person who sent the email know that the email had been opened, even to give it a geographical location for where the email had been opened. And people were up in arms about it. The company changed their policies. But, but unfortunately, the conversation really got misdirected because this has been used for years by newsletters, by spammers, by all kinds of email. This is a very common technique. And the reason it works is when you send that email, if there is even a one-by-one -one invisible image in it, the server that provides that image, and that's what's hidden underneath the code in the email, will get pinged. And it'll say, oh, I see Leo just opened that email because he tried to load that one pixel image. And I see where Leo is. I see his IP address. And I'm going to send that back to the guy who sent it. That's a lot of spam and mail email marketing works that way. Uh, so, so for those of us who don't want to be tracked in that way, and I'm one of them, we don't use images in our email. Now, here's the flaw you've discovered. If you're using a web-based email system like Yahoo, Google, Outlook, you don't control that. You're getting HTML emails. They may not be displaying the images, but they're loading them. So you've discovered uh, the sad truth of this. The only way, if you only, if you don't want these tracking pixels to get the servers to get hit, if you don't want to send a signal back that you're opening the email, you need to use an email client on your desktop that doesn't load images, that uses ASCII only. And there are only a handful of these. Firefox, may, or actually a Thunderbird, I should say, is one of them. You can turn off images. I use a program on Windows and Mac and Linux called Claws, C-L-A-W-S, that will let you do that. It's uh, kind of a more power tool. So that's the problem is HTML emails. They're, they're, there's all sorts of problems. It's not just the tracking. If you're loading a web page in your email and you're doing that with Google and any web-based email and you're doing that with most email clients even on the desktop, you're loading a web page, any exploits, any malware that's on that web page also gets loaded. And so there have been, and this is actually fairly common in many cases, malware that is spread via email. You don't even have to read the message. Just the simple fact of the preview loading in the HTML is enough to trigger the exploit. This is a problem. And it's one of the reasons I don't use HTML email. I don't send HTML email. I don't receive it. And I make, sure, make darn sure images are not rendered in email unless I know it's you, and then I can press the load button and load the image. So I think you... That's you've... especially scary if you're just uh, dipping into the spam to see if they missed anything. You know, if, if they're automatically loading those tracking pixels. Spam. Yeah, I mean, just the preview loads it. Yeah, there. just the preview loads it. So, so yeah, it's don't a use... Filter. They yeah. Just give me a bozo filter. It's a bozo filter. filter. <laughs> so that I can think I'm not loading the email. And you're the bozo. <laughs> Tweak that nose, exactly. silly clown. So uh, here's, the, here's the best way to do it, and it works with Gmail just fine, is don't use the web client. Don't do it in your browser. Get, a, get an email program. Uh, Thunderbird's free. It's a very good one. And turn off image loading. Turn off, as, as, as long as you're doing that, go into composing and receiving emails and turn off HTML. You should be just using plain text. You're going to immediately hate your email. If you're used to HTML email, it's graphical. It has fonts. It has pictures. It's colorful. Now it's just going to be plain text on a page. But That's it's what safer. I'm for. That's what you want. <laughs> it is absolutely what you want. I completely agree with you. This is not hey, something. Thank you for a recommendation from like over 10 years ago you gave me that served me super well. What was that? Super Gen Pass. Oh, yeah. You still use that. It's such a, it's such a simple thing, and yeah. it enables me to have total control and a unique password. And I don't have to pay a monthly fee, and I just really like that. Good. Yeah, Super Gen Pass. It's not yeah. uh, it's not the most secure thing in the world as it turns out but it's good enough
Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's good I mean, enough. it's better than mom or chimp or... It's better monkey. than chimp, monkey123. Don't do that for your passwords and don't reuse passwords either. No, the way SuperGen Pass works is it generates a password based on you have a secret password only you know and mush that up together with the website you're on. So each website has a unique password and that's really more important than anything else. So yeah, I like it. It's still around, huh? That's a nice. great work, Leo. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. Yeah, it's still, it's it's, uh, there's an Android app for it. And, nice. uh, you know, I've had to change, you know, as all of these breaches have gone by in the last 10 or 12 years, you know, nobody's escaped it. No. Um, and so there have been a few times where I've just incremented my my uh, equation forward by one, you know, and that's it's just There worked you go. Fine. Like, I've, even though I've been in the breaches, I've never had any uh, negative effects. There you go. Um, so Nice. Thanks. Thanks for everything, Leo. My pleasure. Thanks for listening all those years. I'm going to find, I just read an article about how difficult it is to do uh, plain text email. You know, the, the world doesn't, uh, doesn't want that. Uh, and, I'm, and Superhuman was, the, was the, where this all came up because this company, Superhuman, where it was accused of spying on people. In fact, they're just doing the same thing everybody else has been doing for years, putting these tracking pixels in email. I don't want to scare you. Most people don't care. But it's another it's another one of these little tiny privacy this death by a thousand privacy cuts inch by inch they're taking it away. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 1888 ask Leo. Oh my goodness. Let's get uh, let's get back to the phone calls, shall we? Jim in Windsor, Colorado. Hello, Jim. Hi, Leo. How are you? Are you? I'm fine. Um. I know there's been talk before about scanning slides. Yes. And I ran across, I've got a Film Scan 35i. Very nice. That's, yeah. Well, I got it from a friend. It's, it scans either a strip of 35 or four slides in a little holder. The only problem is I don't have the software. Yeah, you need a special Film Scan driver. Yeah, and I don't know how to get it. I've looked online, and it's... I have the the definitive answer for you for this. Great. There's a guy named Hamrick. I wish I knew his first name. Um, he is the coolest guy ever. He has, for years, been maintaining a third-party driver for scanners called ViewScan. It's at Hamrick.com, H-A-M-R-I-C-K.com. ViewScan is a Twain driver. Twain is the kind of technology old-timey scanners used to use. And yeah. it yeah. is a standard. That's the good news. And so what he does is he reverse engineers old scan scanner drivers so that you can use this old scanner, which is no longer supported. Microtech doesn't put out the drivers for it or anything. And, and it yeah. lets you use it. And in fact, I think ViewScan is almost always better than the original driver. He's really good. And uh, okay. so he supports, uh, I just checked, he supports the Microtech Film Scan 35, uh, along with several thousand other kind of out-of-date scanners. I think this is a really uh, huge gift to the uh, world that Hamrick has given us. It, his drivers work on um, Windows, Mac, and Linux. You can try them for free. I think he probably, you know, I, he, char he does charge eventually for them. They're not expensive. and So I would try it, make sure it works and all that stuff. But I have to say, I... I think this guy, I doubt he makes a huge amount of money on it, but it is, I plug it whenever I can because it's a really, okay. is really he, incredible. Is he, a, is he a ham? Uh, ham Rick. Maybe he is, maybe his name is Rick and he's a ham. I never thought of that. <laughs> I got to, well, I got to Google. Who is Ham Rick? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I used to be a ham. I yeah. met their others a big ham. Yeah. I have one other thing I'd like to mention, or uh, there's, there was a, on one of your podcasts of, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the guys wanted to use a printer at work, but he wasn't allowed to use the Wi-Fi at work. Right. He could use the Bluetooth. We were trying to figure out what the best way was to do that, yeah. Well, what he Could he have used his phone and add a, a, as a hotspot and then yes. created his own little network? Yes. And then that could... Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely okay. right. That would be one way to do it. Uh, they call it uh, an ad hoc Wi-Fi network, and you can absolutely do that. You're, you're, that's a very good thought. Yeah, use your phone. as a, Make your own internal Wi-Fi that just talks to two things, your computer 
and your uh, printer and and do it on your mm-hmm. phone. Yeah, that's a great idea. Very smart. Didn't even think of that. And, and when I got you, I got one more thing. I got an old HTC phone. It's a PC 3600. It's a it was for on a Sprint service. That's it's not anymore. Right. But I cannot I I I I can uh, open it up, but I can't get it to work with Wi-Fi, even though it shows the little umbrella symbol or whatever you call that. You know the yeah. Well, uh, remember it, that's what it won't, that, that's a, it won't recognize my Google uh, number. Or my, uh, yeah, password. that's because it's a CDMA phone. That's from the old days uh, when Sp- Sprint. Remember Sprint and Verizon used one technology, and T-Mobile and AT and T used another. The T-Mobile AT&T technology, GSM, eventually won globally, uh, and that's kind of left Verizon and Sprint out in the, in you know, and, and those old phones won't work. Remember, you even had to get, if you were a Verizon customer and you wanted to travel internationally, you had to get a special phone from Verizon that was an international phone. Fortunately, those days are gone. Those days are gone. Everything's LTE now. Even the phone calls are over data over the LTE network. 5G is going to replace that. But... That's the problem. You have an old phone, an old HTC CDMA phone. It's not going to join any modern network. It might. You might, if you called Sprint or Verizon, be able to get on their legacy network. I, I, I suppose they're probably still running it, but that those days are numbered also. Everything's good. Even if you buy a, a Verizon or Sprint phone today, you get a SIM card. It's going to run on LTE. So that's just the times have changed. And that old uh, HTC Evo. Nice phone. I loved those HTC phones. By the way, sad story, HTC is basically dead. They they made a great phone, the HTC One, which was, in my opinion at the time, five years ago, the best Android phone out there. But they somehow they lost the battle. They lost to Samsung, I guess somewhat to Google, which makes its own Android phones. And they've just dwindled away. Google eventually hired and bought many of their assets. I think they're still technically... A company, <laughs> but I haven't seen a new HTC phone in some time, which is too bad because they were they were great. The other problem with that uh, is it's running a very old version of Android. It goes back to the earliest days of Android too, which means it's probably not even safe. Even if you could use it, and you could use it with Wi-Fi, I guess not for calling, but just as a browser. But it probably wouldn't be prudent. Wouldn't be right. Because uh, these these old versions of Android are just full of holes. It, one of the biggest problems with an older Android phone is that it, they're just not getting patched. They're not getting fixes. And so they're very vulnerable. So I, I'm sad to say, but that beautiful old HTC Evo is history. Happens faster in cell phones than anywhere else, doesn't it? Alan, uh, Wakefield, hey. Massachusetts. How you doing, Alan? Hey, Leo. Hey, what's up? All right. Yeah, I've been listening to you for a while. Yeah, like the like the screensaver. Wow, that was awesome. Ha! <laughs> that goes back to 1998, my friend. <laughs> you must be an old timer. Yeah, yeah. I've been watching you for a while. Of course, I was 40 when we started it, so I guess I'm the old timer here. What can I? Do? What can I? <laughs> what can I do for you, Alan? Hey, you know. Um, I had, I have my Asus laptop, uh, and I don't know, but uh, it's like, it gets stuck in the BIOS now. And so I don't know, like, uh, what to. Yeah. Usually. So, but, so remember the first thing that happens on a computer is, is it, it loads the kind of very primitive bit of the operating system from firmware that's you call that bios in the old days we called it bios now it's something else but it's the it's the boot loader which then goes looks at the hard drive it doesn't even know about hard drives until it loads that it says yeah there's these things called hard drives look here on the hard drive and you're going to find some more information it gets to the master boot record uh, or the boot sector loads up that information that thing says yeah I'm a hard drive. I got some of Now, guess what? There's an operating system right next to me. Start loading there. And then eventually it gets smarter and smarter as it loads in the operating system. They call this the bootstrap process on a computer because it's pulling itself up by its own bootstraps. Starts with a very simple primitive thing and slowly loads more and more. If you are stopping in the bootstrap process, there's something that 
keeps it from completing. Most of the time, if it's stuck in BIOS, it's because the hard drive's failed. In fact, if you took the hard drive out, you'd get exactly what you're getting right now. It'd go, I don't know what to do next. Now, maybe that hard drive's fine. Maybe it's just that master boot record or the boot sector's damaged. It's hard to tell, you know, and I can't fix it from here. Um, you might try, one thing you can try, if, you, if the computer isn't super old, you might be able to boot to a USB drive. So you might try putting an operating system on a USB thumb drive or an external drive and see if you can boot to that. You'll have to change the boot order in BIOS. If that boots up, the computer is fine. It's just the hard drive. The operating system is messed up. 8888-ASK-LEO. We're going to take a little break. Come back with the final segment of the Tech Guy Show. By the way, Ed Hamrick is the guy who founded the Hamrick Software in 1991. His son, David, now runs the business. Father and son team, Ed and David. David, before he went to Hamrick to work for his dad, worked as a contract iOS developer for Mercury Intermedia. He developed three applications that were number one in the iOS app store. So he followed in his dad's footsteps. He went to Vanderbilt studying computer engineering. He lives in Nashville after having lived in England for 10 years. Ed, Ed Sr., Hamrick Sr., created, uh, he purchased his first film scanner. This is all from the About on uh, Hamrick.com. He's always been interested in photography, purchased his first film scanner, an HP PhotoSmart in 1997. He said, I could do better than the software that comes with this scanner, so he wrote his first program, ViewSmart, then wrote for the Nikon LS30. He wrote a driver for that, renamed it ViewScan. And he's adding more and more all the time, up to 3,000 scanners now. He's kind of the king, I think, of, of <laughs> sc scanner drivers. He went to Caltech, degree in engineering and applied science, worked at JPL as a programmer, Boeing as a programmer and a manager. He was at Convex Computer Corporation as a systems engineer, the inventor of six patents in biofuels technology, the majority owner of the Russian company NanoTiga, Develops nanocellulose from softwood. Wow. And there's an interview. Let me give you the interview. View Scan's creator speaks on the art of the scan. What a story. This guy is a pioneer in computing. Kind of legendary. And I knew nothing about him. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We love Big P. We are musical director. No one holds a baton with the same panache, the same verve, the same savoir-faire. Big Pee-wee. Also, thanks to Kim Schaffer, who's uh, our phone angel answering the phones today. Thanks also to you for being here. Couldn't do this without you. Be silly if I did. Frankly, when I was a young man, I did. <laughs> I would sit in my room and talk to myself. Thank goodness I found a gainful, gainful employee doing that. Debbie on the line from Roland Heights, California. Hello, Debbie. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. What can I do for you? I need to replace my Samsung Galaxy S4. It's no longer working without being plugged into the wall. Yeah, the battery um, died. Yeah. 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 So I... The good, by the way, the good news on the S4, I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to is that was one of the last Samsung Galaxy phones you could pry the back off and put a new battery in. But Samsung doesn't make the batteries anymore. They're third... Um, third parties third are fine. Batteries. I would... Whenever yeah. I... And I wish they still did this, but they stopped a few generations ago. Whenever I bought... When I got a Samsung S4 or an S5, I would buy a third-party charger and batteries, like three of them, because it didn't last that long, right? And then I would just... If the battery died, I'd swap out and put a new one in. So you could keep it alive. I don't recommend it. It's pretty old now. We're up to S10. We're you know six years later. <laughs> yes, yeah. it, it's a little old. Yeah. Um, so I went to the Sprint store to look at phones, and the the person there really didn't give me any information about. <laughs> He's probably in mourning because they're about to be merged into T-Mobile. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Do whatever you want. <laughs> And I'm out of here. Like, pick a phone. I don't care what you want. I don't care what you pick, lady. <laughs> Just buy something. <laughs> That's the kind of service that keeps people coming back, isn't it? Um, yes. I think if you liked your Samsung, I'd see no reason not to get another Sammy. You can get the S9, last year's Samsung, for a pretty good deal, I would imagine. They still sell that. 
what do you think about um, Samsung versus Pixel or LG? Oh, well, okay. Best camera on the market is the Google Pixel. And the Pixel 3a mm -hmm. is very competitively priced. I think it's an excellent phone. Um, I don't think their screens are as good as Samsung's. They get their screen from Samsung, which tells you something. I mean, I think Samsung keeps the best screens for themselves. But that may not matter to you. There's no question the cameras are better. They, they, nobody does better than Google on the cameras. What about battery life? Um, let me think. Yeah, my, my 3A gets very good battery life. All, you know, it's all the current crop of phones get about a day. <laughs> you know, it, you, by the end of the day, you go to bed, you're glad you're home because you only have 10% left. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't expect um, more than that. But, it, you know, if you charge it every night, you should be able to get through a day. Unless you're in an unusual situation, for instance, an area where the cell signal is weak. Sometimes that'll kill a battery real quickly. Uh, well, for instance, keep your, keep your uh, don't, you know, get, get in an airplane and, and don't put it in airplane mode. You'll see your battery just, you could almost watch it go away as it tries to join each tower as it's flying over them. I don't recommend this. Uh, but that's that's the problem. A weak signal will really kill a battery because the phone has to work harder. But if, are there any other pros or cons to any of the the brands? Uh, I I honestly think the Pixel Three A is excellent. Uh, I think the if you want to save money, the Moto G whatever the current one is. I don't know what Sprint has G eight or G nine. Excellent. A um, little less expensive. We're now down to two two to three hundred dollar range. Um, I, I personally think the Samsung S10 is excellent. Oh, I'll give you one more. I don't even know if Sprint sells it, but you could get it unlocked. You might, and by the way, it might be an appropriate time to start thinking about moving to another carrier. Are you very happy with Sprint? Yeah, it's gotten, I, I had Verizon for work and it was terrible. I couldn't get reception in places with my work phone, but I can with the Sprint phone. So. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's totally geographically influenced. If it works where you are, it's the best. They always say the best nationwide coverage, you know, different companies will say that. Meaningless. It only matters if it works where you go. And if, if, you're, right. hap if you're happy with it, I mean, the company, as far as service goes, they're all terrible. So it's not like you're going get, <laughs> to get improved service anywhere. Um, I would, the other one I, I would look at, I don't, I don't know if Sprint offers it. I doubt they do. But I love this phone. It's the OnePlus makes it, Chinese company. Their newest, the 7, uh, 7 Pro is superb beautiful screen it's it has something a little unusual it has a 90 hertz refresh rate so normally you'll see on your tv 30 uh progressive scan maybe 60 90 really gives it a beautiful solid image and if you can if you can see it you'll notice the difference uh it has an excellent uh excellent camera the software i really like because unlike samsung they don't put a lot of stuff on there Samsung, you know, it's crazy. You've got a Samsung browser and a Google browser. You've got a Samsung gallery and a Google gallery. It's crazy. Samsung messages, yeah. Google messages. I hate that. Um, but, I but, do too. Yeah, OnePlus does not do that. They have their own version of Android they call uh, the Oxygen OS, and it's quite good. The other thing they do better, I think, than Samsung is they keep it up to date. I'm still waiting on my S10 Plus for the June update, let alone the July update. Uh, but my OnePlus is just got updated. So I have a feeling uh, they're going to be better on updates as well. That's another one to look at. I think I think the okay. one the OnePlus uh, 7 Pro is a, is a real surprise. It's not the cheapest. I think it's 700. So That's it's, about the range that I was thinking I would have to pay at any yeah. rate. So. And it it should have the best battery life of any phone if battery life is important to you. It has the largest battery certainly of any of the phones we've mentioned. And do any new models come with replaceable batteries, or that's just gone? No, that's gone, because they want them to be thinner. And one way to make them thinner is to take the packaging that surrounds the battery to protect you off. And, right. And so they that's, yeah. no. As far as I, I don't know, does anybody still have a removable battery? I don't think so. That really, I miss that feature. The OnePlus, yeah. the OnePlus easily gets through the day for me. It's amazing in, in terms of battery life. Okay. So that's a good one. So Pixel's good. You can't go wrong with a Pixel. Uh, I think any of the Samsung Galaxy phones are very good. You know the Note's going to be out in a couple of weeks, too, if you like a giant screen. How big is the screen? Uh, I don't know. But uh, the thing is they're making screens bigger without making the phone bigger because they're eliminating the frame. 
Mm-hmm. That's one reason I really like this OnePlus. It's got a giant screen, but the phone is normal size. They have a fingerprint reader on the screen that works better than anybody else's. It's really good. So that's my current favorite right now. But again, the camera, nothing better than a Pixel. The the Note 9 uh, uh, will be 6 points, or Note 10, I guess it is, will be 6.7 inches. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> it's quite large. Uh, yeah. but, but what's nice is because there's no bezels, it's not bigger in your pocket. It's just a bigger screen. It's all screen on the front now. Which is nice. Yeah, um, I love it. This is your main computer what, these days, right? So why not have a big yeah, screen, right? As long as you can carry it. And that's coming out when, you said? Uh, their announcement is in a week, I think. As uh, to when they're releasing it or that? Yeah, no, they should, it should. it should come out, I think, August 9th, 10th, something like that. Okay, excellent. Enjoy um, your new phone, whatever, it, whatever phone you choose. Thanks so much, Leo. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I always hate it when I hear this at the end of the show. It means it's time to say goodbye to all the family. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week. There'll, I'm sure, be lots of crazy tech news we can talk about, and I'll answer all your questions, too. Remember, everything we talk about on this show and every previous show is available on the web for free at techguylabs.com. Tech guy. I'm the tech guy. I'm in my labs. Just imagine me with the lab coat and the gloves and the glasses. You know, safety glasses is always important. TechGuyLabs.com. No sign up. It's free. It's all there. 1,613 episodes. <laughs> mm, 15 years worth of Tech Guys. Lots of shows. And, uh, and you can even leave your comments. Thanks again to uh, Big Pee Wee and to Kim Schaffer. Thanks to you for joining me. I hope you'll come back next week. Don't forget our podcast network all week long at twit.tv. I'm Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.